Hello and welcome to the first in a series of sessions, what is effectively a course, an introduction to AI for designers. This has been organized by Digital Futures. Digital Futures is an online educational platform that uses its platform not only to break through the walls of the classroom, but also to break through some of the social, economic, and political barriers that have otherwise prevented certain people around the world from having access to important educational ideas. Education, we believe, should be a human right and not a privilege of the, wealth, of the wealthy, of those who can afford to pay the fees to go to schools such as Harvard, the AA, and so on. And so we're offering this as a free course, a free course, um, an introduction to what is one of the most important uh, innovations in the design world in recent years. This is then the first of five sessions. Um, we are calling this session Getting Started. Next week, we have a series of presentations looking at how AI is being used in a, a broad range of different areas, from the world of art to fashion design to car design and so on. Then we're moving on back to tutorials with a session on controlling AI and then one on advanced AI, so gradually getting more and more advanced. And finally, we'll be finishing off with a panel discussion that includes some really extraordinary figures, including Patrick Schumacher, Daniel Bolojan, Wan Yu He, and Ross Lovegrove. Um, so uh, today's session then um, is, uh, uh, I'm gonna kick off by offering a, um, a kind of background to AI, and especially trying to trace out not only the, 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 the techniques itself, but the development of AI and how it's been used to generate images. It's not going to be a long introduction, but just looking at this important aspect of what we know, understand, but what we, we're using AI for these days, which is primarily to generate images. We then move on to uh, Joshua Vermillion, Vermillion, who is uh, a professor at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and one of the leading figures in the world in, in terms of uh, AI uh, uh, tutorials. Um, Joshua will be taking us step by step, offering us an introduction into how to get started with mid -journey. And finally, we move on to Sara Faron, who, who is an important part of our Digital Futures team. Sara is an architect from Syria, and she will be <clears throat> taking us into stable diffusion and other aspects. So let me start then, as it were, very at the very beginning, the very moment back in 1956, when the term artificial intelligence was coined. 1956 is not so long ago. Um, and in fact, the whole history of AI is a fairly recent phenomenon. And the term was coined by this guy, John McCarthy, for an event that took place in 1956 in Dartmouth College, where some of the smartest and brightest minds got together in order to look into the possibility of this new field. John McCarthy uh, had, to, had, to use a, uh, had to coin a new name for it, and he, he coined the term artificial intelligence. Not that he was very happy with it, um, because it's not artificial, it's synthetic perhaps, and, uh, but it's the term that stuck, and it's become very, very important. They set off then in 1956 with the idea of within two years of solving the basic problems of AI. That proved to be more challenging than they thought. There are lots of challenges, in fact, involved in it. And the hype uh, about what AI could do was always being kind of met with disappointment when it failed to achieve that hype. And over the first 50 years of its history, AI went through a series of what are called AI winters when funding was withdrawn, when AI was not producing, was not delivering on the hype itself. In fact, by 2012, when uh, uh, the the survivors, as it were, of the original um, of the original uh, event in Dartmouth College, and here we see Marvin Minsky next to John McCarthy. Um, uh, when they got back together, there was precious little to show. AI had really failed to deliver. In particular, of course, it was being set up during the Cold War, and one of the primary purposes, at least in the United States, was to use it as uh, to translate Latin. It proved to be. Very, to, to, to translate Russian, it proved to be very inadequate at translation. So in 2012, even though they got to, 2006, even though they got back together, they had little to show for it. Paradoxically, however, 2006 was roughly the time when the deep learning revolution took off, neural networks. And the reason why it took off 
was largely down to this guy, Geoffrey Hinton. In the first 50 years, there'd been a, a series of competing approaches towards AI. Some had thought that maybe we could model it on the brain and were following neural networks. Uh, others were following logic. In fact, the dominant way approach was a symbolic AI, which was based on logic. And in fact, neural networks never actually managed to, to deliver. And they were, in many ways, they were out of favor uh, for, the first 50, for the first 50 years. And when Jeffrey Hinton was publishing a paper, he, uh, he had to keep quiet about the fact that he was pursuing neural networks. Jeffrey Hinton is an interesting figure. He is the great, great grandson of George Boole of Boolean geometry fame. And he studied at the University of Cambridge. He actually studied architecture for two days before he realized that was not for him. And he moved into natural sciences and then into AI. But he remained convinced that the secret to AI was to model AI on the brain. And that's why he was interested in neural networks. And he steadily plugged away at this, at trying to, to, to get neural networks to work. And eventually, around the turn of the millennium, they began to work. And they began to work mainly because of improvements in the speed and the power of computers. All of a sudden, with GPUs and graphic, graphic processing units, suddenly computers became far more powerful and they were able to do many of the things they couldn't do before. This led to what's known as the deep learning revolution. This is deep learning here. It's based on neural networks. It is part of, of machine learning that is part of the broader category of AI itself. Think of these like Russian dolls nested inside of one another. But if we're talking about AI these days, we are almost certainly talking about deep learning. This is what's powering the revolution behind ChatGPT, behind DALI, Midjourney, Stable Diffusion, and so on. So what exactly is a neural network? This is an example of one. Uh, it's a simplified example because it only shows three hidden layers, but often in a neural network, in a deep learning neural network, there can be up to 5,000 layers, hence the term deep learning. It's about the number of layers. Now, neural networks, artificial neural networks, are modeled very loosely on the brain. They, have the same, they use the same terms of neuron and synapses as, they, as, as in the brain itself. And this, this here is a neuron and this is synapses. And what happens is basically is the information flows from left to right, feed forward as it's called, uh, called um, and it's processed through this. The flow of information is governed by the weights which control it, um, and they're able to actually adjust themselves towards the end. But what happens here, and this is an example of a neural network used to, uh, to um, uh, uh, recognize an image, is that the, the, the information is processed through these layers from left to right until eventually, from the pixels on the left, to, to, to eventually it comes to the conclusion, <clears throat> this is almost certainly a bird. It's never 100% sure, it's normally 99% sure, but it says that it's a bird. Now, this is something we take for granted these days. This is something we all have, we all have facial recognition on our cameras and so on. It's nothing special, but back in 2012, when the breakthrough happened, this was something very, very special. In 2012, there was a competition called ImageNet, where Jeffrey Hinton and his team entered with um, AlexNet, their system. And they showed that neural networks were by far the best way of recognizing an image. And all of a sudden, everyone started paying attention to neural networks. What is interesting about this process is basically you can see how you can go from an image to a word, but the, the real holy grail for computer science was to go the other way around, to it to start with a word and to generate an image, what we call generative AI. And eventually they started playing around with these things. And there was one particular engineer from, uh, from Google called Alex Morvinsev, who realized that you could simply reverse the process. You could invert the network. In other words, instead of going from left to right, from a, a picture of a bird to an image of a bird, you can go the opposite way, from the word bird to hallucinate, to synthesize, to generate an image of a bird. And this led to what's become known as deep dream. 
this somewhat trippy image, and they were all very trippy, um, caused a sensation. In 2018, the first ever exhibition of AI generated art took place, curated by Blaise Aguiriakas in San Francisco, and it was based on Deep Dream. It caused a sensation because of the remarkably strange images, but that was also, in some senses, a limitation of this particular process. What you would do here would you, you would train a neural network on, on a certain set of images. In this case, it looks like it's dogs and serpents, and I guess it's a, 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 a lamp of some kind. Um, and it, whatever it would see, it would, it would hallucinate this particular image. Now, the problem was, however, that the information about where things were positioned was lost in the process. So everything comes out all over the place. It's what's called pose invariant. And that was the limitation of this particular approach. The big change happened <clears throat> with this guy. Um, Ian Goodfellow, who was in a pub in Montreal where he suddenly started devising or thinking up a process that would take us into the next level. And that process is known as generative adversarial networks. Adversarial means basically there are two competing networks, uh, there are two networks competing against one another. There is a generator and there is a discriminator. The generator takes random noise and then generates images that the discriminator then judges against a training set to, to recognize, to evaluate whether it's convincing or not. If it's not convincing, it rejects it, and thereby it trains the generator to improve over time. And eventually the, gener the discriminator can be taken away and the generator will produce perfect images. Think of this a bit like, a, a, let's say, an art forger trying to uh, produce a fake Van Gogh and then Think of the discriminator as maybe being, being an art critic, judging of whether or not uh, it is uh, um, successful. What is interesting, of course, is this reflects in some senses the way that we operate, um, in the sense that if you're a designer, you need critical feedback in order to improve. But also, conversely, if you're a di discriminator, if you're a theorist or a critic, you need to you know, make your, your criticism um, imaginative and creative. This led to an extraordinary breakthrough. All of a sudden, we were able to generate to hallucinate images that were really quite convincing. This is an example of style GANs, one of the earliest versions of GANs, um, and it's based on, uh, on human faces, on actors and so on. Um, and what it's doing effectively is, is generating a whole series of people who do not exist. In fact, there's a website, This Person Does Not Exist, where you can find out you can generate your own images. This was a huge breakthrough. Um, but it took until 2019 for anyone to start using this to generate architecture. This is the work of media artist Refik Anadol, who in 2019 uh, took a data set based on the work of Zaha Hadid architects and began to, uh, to develop a latent space walk whereby you could hallucinate, interpolate other possible versions of this um, by uploading thousands upon thousands of images onto the computer and then allowing it to do this latent space walk. This was a very laborious process, a very time-consuming process, but nonetheless, ev eventually, it began to produce something that was really quite remarkable. Even though Zaha Hadid herself is no longer with us, uh, it was able to generate an image that appears as though it were designed by Zaha Hadid. And this was the breakthrough that opened up the possibility of others to generate architectural designs. And so here we have it, the first ever, I believe, GAN-generated image of a, of a design, an architectural design, produced by a media artist, uh, Refik Anadol. And this, in fact, was the, the, the design, the image that we took for, the, for my book, the first ever mainstream book on AI and architecture in the English, English language. And, a lot the, and as, that, as we began to develop, so there were um, other approaches uh, that were being used. Uh, this is the work of Karl Pimmelblau, um, led by Daniel Bolajan, where he's using cycle GANs, a, a, a set of unpaired, uh, unpaired data sets, which are, are brought together 
which are able to extrapolate. In other words, because you're breeding one set off against another, you're not limited by a finite data set, but rather you can open up and look at other ones. At the time, this was really the state of the art uh, in, in uh, the use of AI in architecture. And in 2021, uh, uh, Wolf Pricks received a Lifetime Achievement Award from Acadia, and, and this project was awarded a Digital Futures Award. Um, and indeed, it, the, the results are really not bad. There are glitches to be found, um, and uh, it's nothing is totally perfect. Uh, and in fact, if you find a GAN that is looking perfect, you know that someone's been um, touching it up with some form of post-production. But this really was suggesting the possibility uh, of how you could use these techniques and take it further. This was based on over a thousand projects from the Corp Himmelbile um, OVRA, and it was basically producing other potential Corp Himmelbile images. And this was the, the project that we decided to put on the front cover of the AD, Machine Hallucinations, Architecture and Artificial Intelligence, one of the slew of books that came out at the beginning of the first half of 2022. But then everything changed. Suddenly, a new technique was developed by uh, uh, called DALI, DALI 2. There had been DALI 1 beforehand, but the DALI 2 was the first one that was actually eventually launched to the public. And this was operating in a fundamentally different way. It wasn't based on generative adversarial networks. It was based on diffusion models. Using a, a form of Gaussian noise from a Markov chain, an image would be disrupted, and in repairing itself, it would produce something new. Now, a lot of people think that somehow AI copies things. It doesn't copy. What it does is search and synthesize. And this is why this particular um, uh, uh, image became so important. Diffusion models then are based on a very, very different concept. They're based on prompts. You feed it words and it uses generative AI to produce an image. In this particular case, the prompt was an astronaut on a horse. Now, presumably, there's never been an astronaut riding a horse like this, but what it was able to do was able to interpolate the possibilities of what it would have looked at, looked like. And this was really what made it so shocking and so novel. The other important aspect about this was it was quick. It, it, it was based on pre-trained models, so you didn't have to uh, train the models yourself, and you didn't have to know too much about computation. There are a number of, 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 of extraordinary um, uh, results that came out very early on. This one, a, a cat dressed as the French Emperor Napoleon holding a piece of cheese. The text itself above is complete gobbledygook, but the image itself is quite convincing. Or indeed this one, an old painting of a teenager texting a boyfriend, beautiful lighting, Caravaggio, 1580. Clearly in 1580, there were no mobile phones. And yet what's happening here, it's beginning to hallucinate, it's beginning to synthesize an image that gives the impression of what it would have been like. And then suddenly, this burst onto the architectural scene, and it was Refik Anadol, again, who was behind this. Anadol was somebody who had been allowed to experiment with DALI uh, before it had been released to the general public, and because he was an expert in the field, and he collaborated with Zaha Hadid Architects to produce these kind of images, that, which were really taking AI to the next level. And, and all of a sudden, you get a great, these are still two-dimensional, but you have a, a much more sense of three-dimensional awareness. You have a sense of materiality and so on. This was the moment, in some senses, when everybody woke up to the possibility of AI. Now, the, at that time, it was only available to a few experimental artists and so on. But it wasn't long before the second half of, um, of 2022, when these were released first, Midjourney and then Dali, Dali 2, and then a slew of other platforms that allow us to go and generate what we can generate today. So not only can Zaha Hadid architects go and generate an image in the style of Zaha, even though Zaha is no longer with us, but others can too. Soon everyone will be able to explore the possibilities of this, which is extraordinary because it was so quick and the images, the resolution of the images was so much better than everything, if anything before. And of course, what it was suggesting, it was opening up the possibilities of what we could imagine. It became a, a prosthesis to the imagination. And prompt engineering, in other words, 
being very precise about how you describe uh, uh, um, in words what you wanted became a very important skill. In my own work, I tried to uh, follow the logic uh, of cycle GANs but by breeding um, two concepts off another. Um, in this case, it's an orchid and it's a stool, so you get an orchid stool, or indeed I would include something in the prompt. Uh, in this case, it was actually a, a particular frog from the Amazon that had rather beautiful markings on it, and I would include that in the prompt, and then all this pattern making became the result of that. Extraordinary work started coming out of the computer. And gradually and gradually, this work got more and more refined, more and more precise, of just different versions of Midjourney came out. We are now at, the, at Mid Journey 5.2, but Mid Journey 6 is apparently going to come out very soon. And, and we're getting far more resolution, far more precision. The challenge, of course, with all this is to be able to overcome the bias, the aesthetic that otherwise would be generated by Mid Journey, which is a kind of curvilinear one, to be very precise and to get it disciplined. But when if you can do that, if you can get your prompt right, then you can just generate uh, image after amazing image, um, and you can do it incredibly quickly. And what we're seeing now then is, is something extraordinary in terms of developing this thing. And, and it's if you, you have to include in this, and Joshua will talk about this, no doubt, uh, some reference to the rendering uh, and, and some reference to the lighting conditions. Um, and it does the rest all by itself, especially the reflections. This is truly astonishing. It's all automatically done. This image is generated in roughly three seconds. And gradually, gradually, as we start getting further, we start developing a kind of almost like a new language of architecture that's coming out of this technique, opening up possibilities and really leading to a, a, a fresh burst of formal creativity. It doesn't have to be a, a chaotic kind of a progressive design. It could be more traditional rectilinear design. Um, it could be very simplistic in some senses, but the, the same, the, the, the technique itself works for everything. And it is causing something of a sensation um, in the world of architecture. And this leads to this kind of image that's on the, on the, on the, the poster. Um, and, and, and what is interesting about this is, is that when you write a prompt, you don't necessarily have to include all the details. In this particular prompt, um, I, I think that the, the text was something like uh, ultra contemporary modernist kitchen. And it decided um, what the layout should be. It decided to put this painting on the background. It decided to put this, this bush outside. It decided to put this coffee maker, this tap here, and so on and so on. What it's doing effectively is designing this for us. It seems to me very clear that these models are quite capable of understanding the logic of composition and putting together an architectural design. And so this one, for example, again, all it was in the, in the prompt, apart from a lot of words, I mean, maybe 70 or so words describing the kind of lighting conditions, the ultra hyper-realism of the image, the detail, the uh, and, and so on, uh, all it said basically was uh, a, a contemporary, uh, ultra contemporary modernist building in the Austrian Alps. That is all it said. All the details of the building were generated automatically by Midjourn. And all the details of the landscape, this, these rocks in the foreground, these mountains in the background, this valley, this bush and so on, were all done, generated, by mid-journey. That, to my mind, is truly, truly astonishing. And there's become a whole industry of this. If you go onto Instagram, you can see the work of, um, of David Orth, midjourney.architect, where every day, maybe several times a day, people like David are just churning out, churning out designs one after the other, all totally remarkable. Um, and this is really something incredibly new. Everyone is posting on Instagram, and the speed of development is quite extraordinary. Unless you keep pace with things, you're not going to get as many likes as you would in the old days. But we're seeing something very, very special. Carlos Spanion, who will be uh, talking in our tutorial, uh, is, has been using ControlNet to keep things very controlled. 
And, and there are a series of these techniques that have been developing where people are using these diffusion models along with other software in highly, highly inventive ways. Now, what do I think is happening here? Well, what I would say is basically, even though this model of the, of, of the, the, the Jennifer Avicera network is not what we're doing today, the diffusion model, I mean, by, by mid-journey, Dali and so on, these diffusion models operate in a very, very different way. But I think this kind of conceptual model of what's happening is what is really is, 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 is explains how we're interacting with it. Because human beings, I would claim, are not very, very imaginative, or at least not as imaginative as we like to think ourselves. But we are very, very good discriminators, almost instantaneously. If we taste a cocktail, we can judge whether we like it or not. If we smell a perfume, we can judge. And also, if indeed we look at an image, very, very quickly, we can judge that. We are very, very good discriminators, but I think we are a bit limited in terms of our imagination. So what's happening is that mid-journey and Dali and so on are enhancing this. It's becoming, these, these tools are coming a prosthesis to our imagination, throwing up way more options than we would ourselves would imagine, and therefore enhancing our capacity as designers to become supercharged designers. We are, in some senses, these cyborgs that are using this technique to open up new possibilities about architecture. This has led, of course, to a series of exhibitions about this, this image-based make, making. What I would claim, though, is this is just the tip of the iceberg. These are just images. And what we're going to see in the future is something truly extraordinary that is going to revolutionize the whole world of design. We're beginning to see this now with people like uh, uh, Daniel Bolajan, who's been exploring the possibility of, of training these, um, <clears throat> these networks, not just on images, but on parameters. So what you begin to get is a more coherent image and one which in, in where you can begin to sort of uh, make connections between east, west, north, south elevations and begin to start seeing things in 3D. Uh, uh, there are maybe a handful of experts and we Bring, we're bringing the, all the best people together in this particular series. There's a kind of handful of experts who are really pushing the boundaries of what is possible in terms of AI. Alongside that, let's not forget the whole question about performance. Performance, not only structural performance, but also environmental performance, acoustic performance, and so on. It's not just a question of images. And we can see here how the, the uh, uh, that, that infrared, for example, which is a software that is a deep learning based software um, that's been used to model um, environmental performance is really going to kick in and make a huge difference to the way in which we design buildings in the future. Um, but also, also, um, and we don't know quite what is happening, but we do know there are firms such as XCool or LookX, as it now is in the West, who are developing tools that are really going to radically overhaul the whole design process. This is an early version um, of the work of uh, Wan Yu He, who used to work for um, Rem Koolhaas, hence the name XCool. Um, and this is, a, this is a, a, a short uh, uh, project they did called um, This Building Does Not Exist, based on the, the model This Person Does Not Exist. And then more recently, uh, XCool has uh, opened up a branch um, in the West, uh, LookX. And it's just, this is the inversion, as it were, of let's call just as OMA can be inverted into um, a AMO. And, and what we're going to see from these kind of platforms is something radically, radically new. This is the work of Tim Fu, who's been using LookX to, um, to, to, as a kind of filter, as it were, on the model that is being trained on architecture. And this is important because Midjourney, DALI, and all these other models are basically generic models. They're not trained on architecture. They're just trained on lots and lots of data. They are, this one is trying to customize it, as indeed our core people in their office. In other words, to overcome the implicit biases in platforms like Midjourney and DALI, the implicit aesthetic biases, and to produce something that is customized for a particular office. So you get a crumpled piece of paper and you can filter it through one way and you get the work of a morphosis I think the other one is an opera Zahar or what, but it's basically you can generate many different options. <clears throat> and this is going to be the future. 
The future, we don't know when it's going to come out, but we know that they're working on it. There are no details yet of what's been worked on, but I can tell you that what's going to happen in the future, we're going to have a platform in which the entire design process is going to be automated. It's going to be automated and it's going to have built into it to certain features. Features such as cost control, um, structural performance, building codes, and so on. So effectively, you cannot design anything that doesn't conform to building con to building, con to, uh, uh, building codes and so on. Um, and it keeps a track of cost. Not only that, but, because, but what's going to happen at the moment, if you look at an office like Zahid Architects, they have a series of different processes they go through. They might start with mid-journey to, to brainstorm ideas. Then they would work in Maya to model it. And then they'd go into Rhino and then into BIM. Eventually, this is going to be on one single platform, and we're going to go from data to fabrication. That is the true revolution that's going to happen in two or three years' time. But what I would say is we get a glimpse, a glimpse of the possibility of what AI can do by seeing the extraordinary images that are already being generated by Midjourney, Dali, and so on. I'm going to unshare my screen now and uh, welcome uh, Joshua, who will be taking us through um, uh, uh, as a, a kind of step-by-step -step introduction to how you get going um, with Midjourney. Um, welcome, Joshua. Right. Thank you, Neil. And um, <clears throat> hello, everyone. Um, it's morning time here in Las Vegas. So good morning from sunny Las Vegas. Let me just share my screen. You got a bit of a technical problem. You're trying to fix it. Okay. Um, so uh, this is always a challenge of being online when um, uh, you always are susceptible to these things. Um, It went down, so it's trying to come back. Okay. So um, my apologies. We're just waiting for Joshua, <clears throat> Joshua Vanillion to come back. Um, Joshua is, as I mentioned, um, a professor at the University of Nevada in Las Vegas. Um, and uh, he has quite an extensive following on Instagram um, and has become one of the leading figures um, in the world in terms of AI generated design. Following on from that, we were going to have um, Sarah Farron, who's going to be introducing stable diffusion and some other items. Um, So um, if we don't get Joshua back, I think we should have Sarah going first um, before him. But let's just give it another um, minute or so. Um, I'm not sure quite what's happened. Um, he said it's coming back on a second. Okay, so let's... Oh, he on. just came. He's, he's back, he's back. 
Okay, great, good. Joshua's back. Fantastic. Joshua, great to, to have you back. Um, let's hope there are no more glitches. Right, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, sorry, my laptop froze right up. I'm, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm back on. Um, let me share. All right. Um, so uh, thanks again, Neil. Um, and thanks for that um, introduction. That was, uh, it's kind of humbling to sort of remind yourself like how how much history is behind all this stuff, how much hard work was put in. And now it, it looks relatively easy, almost like magic when you're using these uh, uh, generative AI platforms. Uh, so today I'm gonna introduce MidJourney. Um, <clears throat> And I'm going to start from the very, very beginning. Um, and so uh, first off, right, you're going to go to two websites. Um, so you need to make a MidJourney account. You can go to midjourney.com. And when you do that, this is what it looks like over here on the left. Um, down here in the bottom right-hand corner, you can join the beta, um, register, give it your email address. Um, sometimes they have uh, a number of free uh, roles or moves you can make. Um, it, but uh, by and large, this is a subscription service. So you're running it on their servers, uh, it costs them money. So they, they charge you to, to use the service. It's usually a monthly fee. Um, I So this is midjourney.com. Um, you don't actually run midjourney on midjourney.com. Um, in fact, when you are logged in and you go back to midjourney.com, it's basically just a catalog, a sort of gridded searchable um, repository of everything you've generated. You actually interact with midjourney and in in another app called Discord. So once you, or on midjourney.com, you sign up, it'll actually give you, uh, the company will actually give you an URL, um, a, an invite to a Discord server for midjourney. Um, if you don't have Discord and you don't have to use Discord, don't worry, it's not too difficult, um, but you have to go to discord.com and download it. It's an app, it's free. Um, it runs on Windows, it runs on um, uh, Mac OS, iOS, uh, uh, Android, et cetera, right? So you can run it on your smartphones, you can run it on your laptops or your desktops. And let me just show you what that looks like. Actually, this this is a screenshot right here of um, of Discord in the Midjourney server. So you can see, um, if you can see my cursor, um, there's a number of channels along the left hand side. There's a welcome. There's a, a several different rooms for folks who are new um, that you can actually then uh, start to to message the Midjourney bot. So, and that's how you interact with with Midjourney, right? You're, you're basically chatting, basically texting back and forth with the Midjourney bot. You text it a prompt and uh, a little more about that here in a minute. And uh, Midjourney bot will text you back images based off of that prompt, it tries to sort of draw novel images off of your descriptions. Um, when you go to one of these newbie rooms, uh, you'll see that um, the, the rooms themselves actually jump around. It's, it's a lot of complete strangers all playing around with Midjourney in the same uh, uh, room. And so it jumps around quite a bit. It can be very frustrating. Um, what I do recommend, and uh, with the screenshot here, you can basically find any, any message from the Midjourney bot and click on Midjourney bot, and it brings up this box. And then at the bottom, you can actually just write a quick message to the Midjourney bot. And that'll actually open up your own direct message thread um, with Midjourney bot. So you can actually curate your own um, uh, image generation on your own thread. Um, you can actually create your own servers and, and do this as well. But when you're just getting started, um, I found it's it's really nice. It's just sort of like having a, a a thread that when you're texting back and forth with somebody on your on your smartphone. So um, it's it's actually quite nice, and you don't actually have to worry about all these strangers, um, other other images popping up in in front of your own, and um, and so it, it sort of helps you keep things more organized. It's searchable, etc. Right. And then Discord is all about just sending messages to people. Um, in fact, it's these rooms are where you can sort of chat back and forth with teams. Um, and so uh, basically in this thread at the very bottom where you would normally type in, let's say a text message, um, all you have to do is type in a special command to talk to the, the mid-journey bot. Um, it's slash imagine. Um, once you do that, then uh, the mid-journey bot asks you, okay, well, what do you want me to generate? 
Um, and so it uh, follows with the description. And let's talk about these prompts now in a little more detail. So we have that uh, slash imagine at the left-hand side. You can see that after that, there's basically three or so main parts to a prompt. We'll talk about each of these one by one in uh, more detail. Um, but first, we can actually give it image prompts. Neil talked a little bit about this when he was talking, he was showing these uh, uh, sort of takeoffs of the Barcelona Pavilion and a frog, right? He, I think he used a, probably an image prompt for some colors and patterns and textures then to sort of combine with Mies van der Rohe. Um, and so you can actually feed it a number of, of image prompts. You do this by uploading the images and then feeding the, the web address or URL of each image at the very beginning of the prompt. Afterwards, you can write a text prompt. So this is where you can write a description. This is actually quite a, a short description. Um, and so I'll, I'll, more about that in a little bit, but uh, in a tall interior space, let's say. Um, now I, I would actually encourage you to be more descriptive than that um, uh, with more details. But uh, in other words, we can give it images, then we can give it words. And then at the very end, we have uh, uh, parameters. We can actually gain more control over the outputs. Um, in this case, we're changing things like aspect ratio or doing something called negative prompting. And again, we'll we'll go into these in a moment, um, one by one. First, let's focus on that middle part, the text prompts. Right, so here's an example of a, a, just a, a, a text prompt. It's a sort of medium size, not too long, not too short. It says, slash imagine a mid-rise apartment building made from a dense matrix of timber in an urban city with people walking and lots of plants, comma, dramatic sky and light rays. Um, and then uh, you text that to the mid-journey bot and the mid-journey bot texts you four images back in a two by two uh, grid. Um, you can see that, you know, largely the the, the ingredients are there that I, I mentioned, right? It's a mid-rise apartment building. Um, there's lots of push and pull, almost like uh, like the form is derived from, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, a Jenga set or a dense matrix of timber. Um, and then it act actually added cyclists, humans, pedestrians, um, plants, plants along the building, plants at street, et cetera, right? And uh, then again, you can always talk about setting, dramatic sky, light rays, anything else that you want to you want to add the ambiance, the atmospherics, et cetera, right? So that's just a basic basic text prompt for mid-journey. Here's another one. An immersive pop-up store, oh, sorry, an immersive pop-up fashion store made from inflated, translucent, polychromatic, tubular latex membranes in the shape of an elaborate knot, right? So again, um, at the very end, I'll, I'll go over a sort of framework that, that helps me sort of drive uh, prompts. Um, but, you know, all the ingredients that I described here are, are pretty much there. It's, um, this thing looks inflated, it looks tubular, it's, it's uh, multicolored, it looks like it's latex or some other sorts of uh, rubber or plastic material. Um, it's, it's braided and, and wound up and tied up into an elaborate knot, and it actually happens to be in a fashion store, right? So you can see cases of clothes and things around it. Right, so uh, one more of these, and let's talk about adding some more complexity. So this is an immersive spatial installation made from blow, blue glowing acrylic petals hanging from the ceiling of a tall gallery, comma, volumetric lighting. Uh, so again, I'm describing the subject and describing maybe what it should look like, uh, coloration, uh, geometry, um, then where it's located, and then any atmospherics, right? So, um, now, what's interesting is I use the word petals. Um, I have a tendency to, to sort of use words like that, but I, I, I sort of mean something more generic. Um, in this case, mid-journey, um, you know, reverted back to its training data, and I think sort of looked at um, the millions of images of flower petals and decided to draw these things as flower petals, which is not exactly what I wanted, right? So let's talk about how we can gain more uh, control, right, um, over the outputs, right? One way is I could begin to take the word petals out and try to come up with a new word. But I, I was kind of dead set on petals. So this is an example where I can start to add an image prompt, right, at the very beginning. Um, and, and, and image prompts in uh, mid-journey um, are kind of like style references or reference images, right? You might get some of the geometry from this. It might draw the, the color scheme from an image. You can actually uh, input more than one image uh, as, a, as part of the image prompt, right? And, and so let's get to the back to the, uh, the anatomy of a prompt, right? So now we're talking about that first matter, the sort of front matter of the prompt, right? So we have the command imagine, and then URLs of any images that we want to give to sort of help guide mid-journey, um, let it see uh, more examples of kind of what we were looking for. And that'll work in conjunction with 
the text prompt. Right? So um, in this case, I, I'm used, still using the same text prompt, immersive spatial installation made from blue glowing acrylic petals, et cetera. Um, and, and then I combine a photograph of an old installation that I, I was a part of making a long time ago, right? So this is more of what I had in mind. You know, these sort of petals are, are more like acrylic triangle, triangulated uh, 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 panels and um, the blues and whites that sort of wash across them. Um, so they're sort of backlit by LEDs, right? And so once I combine my text prompt with an image prompt, I start to gain more control. You can see um, that it is starting to uh, give me a little more uh, discipline here when it comes to the geometries and the shapes and how it's dealing with lighting and color based off of that uh, style image. Right? So these are a couple of examples where I'm combining that image, that photograph um, with, uh, with the text prompt in order to um, sort of direct mid-journey to, to a more, uh, uh, more desired outcome. Uh, and this is exactly what the prompt looked like, right? So again, I'm not not making this up. Slash imagine, there's a command. Um, then I I used a, a, the URL of the image and then followed that with the text prompt again. So that's basic image prompting or using images with text uh, in order to uh, in order to to um, use that reference, that style reference from an image. Right. Let's talk about the last part here. Um, the the parameters. Um, and so, you know, in this case, we're, we're changing the aspect ratio. We're doing something called negative prompting. Let's talk a little bit about how these parameters work. And, and, uh, I'm, I didn't actually, um, uh, you know, copy and paste all this stuff out. This is the directly lifted from the documentation for mid journey. So this is a reminder to me also to point out this URL at the bottom, right? Uh, that if, if you have any questions while you're, you're playing around with mid journey, you're sort of interrogating it as a tool. Um, the documentation at docs.midjourney.com is actually really good. It's actually very handy. It's very helpful. It's not too long. It's not too short. Uh, they try to do a good job. They curate it every time they uh, add a new tool um, or, uh, or change uh, models or come up with a new version. Um, it's searchable. It's actually pretty well organized. Um, but here you can see uh, from the, the Midjourney documentation, um, that there's a number of, of parameters you can actually uh, uh, use at the end of your prompts. Um, so we just talked about changing the aspect ratio. You can do a dash dash AR or dash dash aspect followed by a space, and then you can actually give it a ratio um, of width to height uh, separated by a colon, right? So if I wanted to go widescreen, I could say dash dash AR space, then 16 colon nine, right? If I wanted to have a tall composition, I could say dash dash AR space uh, two colon three, right? Then I would get uh, a ratio of two parts wide to three parts height, right? I think, um, I, I don't remember the exact uh, number um, uh, or the exact uh, limits to the uh, aspect ratios, but I think it's something like 15, it's not exactly a whole number either. It's like 15 to one or something like that. So you can actually do, um, ridiculously long or tall uh, uh, um, outputs if you want. And there are other uh, parameters here dealing with how quickly uh, you want mid-journey to work. And of course, that, that deals with how much server time you're using. Um, so you see things like fast mode and relax mode and turbo mode. Um, let's talk about a few more of these really quickly. So um, there's one called image weight. So if I give it an image prompt or more than one image prompt, I can actually uh, uh, weight uh, that image either stronger or weaker than the text prompt by using the dash dash IW um, uh, parameter at the end of the prompt, right? So by default, it's set to one, which means it's sort of one-to-one -one, uh, strength ratio with the text prompt. If I wanted to uh, weight the image more, then I could uh, give it a, a number somewhere between one and two. And if I was getting too much of the image and wanted the, the text prompt to sort of shine through a little more in the results, I could lower that somewhere between zero and one. All right, uh, right below that, you see dash dash no, that's called negative prompting. Um, sometimes when you're uh, 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 using mid journey, you get, you get things that you didn't want or you didn't uh, uh, necessarily um, anticipate. And so if you re-roll the prompt, you can actually add um, negative prompting, dash, dash, no, followed by a space, followed by things that you don't want to see, you don't want it to draw. Um, so I liken this to sometimes uh, 
you get a plant or, uh, or, or a human or something like that in your, your rendering that you didn't really want, um, you could actually uh, uh, negative prompt that out. Um, and you would just use, a, uh, use that as a parameter at the end of your, of your prompt. Um, there are qualities. Uh, just remember that. Oh, um, here we go. Um, so there, there's quality parameter where you can you can sort of uh, tell it how many times you how much rendering quality time you want to spend. That uses up GPU minutes. So if you want to play around with that, just be mindful of of, uh, of that. You know there is a finite amount of time you get to fast mode uh, generation, etc. And there are other helpful things here. Um, things like repeat. So if you have a prompt and you just want to sort of see it run four, five, ten times, um, you can simply say repeat slash slash re dash dash repeat, um, and then give it the number the number of times you want it to sort of roll that prompt. Um, so you don't have to wait for the first time to sort of um, denoise and finish and then hit reroll uh, over and over again. You can just simply say repeat it ten times or forty times in this case. Um, and then Neil talked about how these these diffusion models work. They all start with a a seed of uh, visual noise, Gaussian noise, or static. Um, there's actually a finite number of static seeds that uh, Midjourney use, and usually just sort of selects randomly from. Um, you can see it's actually quite a large number, um, but uh, you know each of those seeds actually has an identifier. And so theoretically, if you use the exact same prompt with the exact same seed you get the exact same result, or at least close to it as it denoises. Um, and so that's, uh, you can actually use specific seeds if you're um, used it for one prompt, and then you, you sort of say, well, you know, I, I want to change a few of the materials around, but I wanted to get sort of the, the, the same general composition. You can actually um, call out that specific seed, um, change the prompt around a bit and, and get similar results, but, but maybe uh, with whatever differences you're, you're prompting. Um, and then there's other things here like style and stylize. Um, basically, uh, those are ways to uh, either go back in, in time to other versions of Midjourney um, or to sort of uh, allow Midjourney to um, uh, you know, take a little more artistic license um, <laughs> uh, when it's interpreting and then denoising from your um, from your from your prompt, right? So if you think about it, it looks at a prompt and probably positions it somewhere in latent space, um, denoises uh, the stylized. You can actually up that number and get uh, things that are are further from your prompt, or you can lower that number and get things that are much more literal to your prompt. Um, depending on how much you you want mid-journey to sort of ad lib um, or, or fill in details. Um, one more I'll just sort of mention here is tile. That, that can come in handy if you're trying to make repeatable patterns and textures. Um, if you type in uh, dash dash tile at the end of your prompt, um, then it'll create uh, the, the, the results will all be sort of tileable. In other words, the left edge will match up with the right edge. The top edge will match up with the bottom edge, and you could actually theoretically make a grid of, of your uh, outputs to, to sort of match up and repeat uh, like a wallpaper. All right, so that was a lot of information. Um, and this came directly from the documentation for Midjourney. But now we've sort of covered the three sort of main areas of, of how you can write a prompt. Um, let's talk about a different command, right? We all This whole time we've been talking about slash imagine. Um, there are other ways to talk to the Midjourney bot. Um, and uh, uh, you can actually use a different command called blend. Um, what blend does is it actually prompts you then for um, two to five images. I can't remember if you can actually add more than, than five, but um, you can add two or more images and it'll try to blend them together. It's basically running a prompt with only image prompts and no text prompts. Uh, it, it comes right out and says so in the documentation. So in this case, if I run slash blend it's rather than slash imagination or slash imagine right so slash blend um uh, the bot through discord will ask me to give it some images let's say i start start with this left image and then i give it also this right image and then what it texts me back are are blends it's trying to sort of put these two things together and you start to get materials textures colors and shapes geometries uh the settings from from both sort of put together in, in weird um novel ways right so uh, that's an example of blend. And this is a way where you can actually begin to um, integrate other sorts of parts of your design process, you know, traditional design process and workflows 
Um, if you sketch, if you make models, if you have screen captures from software, virtual model, um, you can begin to sort of enter those in and let AI riff off of them, and you can even begin to uh, blend things together. Here's an example of one that's a quick uh, study model and then a, a sort of urban skyline. Um, and then here's mid-journey sort of combining those two things together. So riffing off of the uh, the this sort of normative model there and then placing it in, in an urban context and um, adding all of those uh, um, tail lights and, and urban infrastructure sort of threading through. Um, or a graphite uh, photo, or sorry, graphite drawing and then a, a quick rendering um, and you get things that don't necessarily look like mid-journey right out of the box. Um, so sometimes it's a, it's a fun way to sort of take uh, what you're working on um, and, uh, and, and be surprised uh, by um, how mid-journey can sort of combine whatever you're, you're doing, you're drawing, you're uh, making, you're painting, whatever you're describing through words, um, combine that, but combine your imagination with its latent space to, to generate some truly interesting um, and surprising results. Right. So um, there's one other command that I want to, to bring up here. So we'll talk about this last command. Then we'll talk about uh, once we've generated images, there's all sorts of things we can do uh, with them to create variations and, and upscale them and things like that. Um, so there's a whole new suite of tools that you can use after you've generated images. And then we'll talk a little more about prompting and, and some of my suggestions on how you can how you can start to get more out of mid-journey, particularly when it comes to architecture, interior environments, et cetera. Right, so the last uh, command I'm gonna go over is slash describe. Um, this is the reverse process to um, giving it a text prompt and then getting images in return. So this is giving mid-journey an image um, and then it'll try to give you four versions of possible prompts that describe the image. Um, so sometimes this can come in handy when you're you're trying to sort of wordsmith something, um, just to sort of see well what what does Midjourney see from this image, and what kind of words, artists, and architects, designers will it name drop? Uh, you know, artistic movements um, and other sort of descriptive words. Right? You can see I gave it in this case an actually Midjourney generated image of what looks like some sort of Chihuly like. Uh, uh, colored glass, uh, but but at a scale that's that's architectural, right? It's sort of vaulted and with columns and things like that. Um, and so Mid Journey gave me four options, right? One is a glass room surrounded by many colored sculptures. Um, you see words like translucent, resin, waves, uh, religious art. You see uh, uh, a number of, of things here: flowing draperies, digitally enhanced soft watercolors, dreamlike tangled nests. You know, there, there's a, a you, you can start to sort of mix and match. I, I liken it to sort of the, there's a game called Mad Libs where you you sort of talk, you, you sort of give uh, um, list nouns and verbs and adjectives and they get actually rearranged into weird combinations, right? Um, and so you can actually play that game with Midjourney and it, it actually likes to sort of combine disparate things together and, and create new things from it. Um, so this is an example where it'll give you uh, four prompts, four example prompts from an image. Um, and then without having to really like sort of laboriously select and copy and paste these things, you can actually run any of these uh, separately, or you can just sort of try to run all of these prompts together with an imagine all, and just sort of see and test uh, how well uh, Midjourney did um, in uh, in trying to come up with a prompt for that image and see how how uh, how close or far away the results actually are from the original image. Right, so that's another way to begin to generate words uh, and sort of come up with, uh, uh, expand your vocabulary when talking back and forth with mid-journey. All right. Okay, so uh, this is a, just a, you know, it's a quick example I was uh, just had on um, Discord. Um, so the prompt here was a monumental undulating space carved entirely from polychromatic laminated paper. That's That's actually a really short prompt and I didn't really tell it to put a human in. I didn't uh, give it much in, in terms of lighting. Um, although monumental undulating spaces, right? Like it sort of, um, you know, probably has some, some ideas from that, from the training data. I'm gonna see some of those words. Um, but once it generates this, this uh, four square um, set of images and, and text it back to you, you'll see that you have a number of options down below, a number of tools. So the first one, um, is you can begin to upscale these things. You can make them larger um, and separate them out into individual images. 
Um, so you'll see under here that we have a U1, a U2, a U3, and a U4. Um, one referring to the top left, two to the top right, three to the bottom left, and four to the bottom right. So if I wanted to upscale this bottom uh, left image, I would click U3, and, and then um, that's basically text the bot, and then the bot texts back a, a larger version of that, that third image. Um, you can also, from there, actually use um, variation tools. But I want to show you um, how you can, uh, there, there's actually a, a, a number of, of new variation tools that have come online over the last couple of months. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in just a minute. We'll look at what happens when you upscale an image and then you get a, a whole another set of variation tools. Um, this uh, button at the far right with the blue and the arrows, um, that's re-rolling. You can basically just rerun that prompt. Um, and, uh, you know, so if you like what you saw or you don't like what you saw and see what happens if it generates it again, you can hit that re-roll and it'll generate it again. You don't actually have to keep typing or copying and pasting the same prompt. You can just sort of re-roll it if you want to run it again. All right. Uh, once we upscale, here's an example of uh, another image that's been upscaled in Discord, right? So this was, I, I always just try to include the prompts and, and include a variety of things just so you can sort of see how I approach prompting. Um, this one is kind of weird, an undulating topographic flooded beach interior with organically shaped ornate vaulted forms made entirely from undulating parametric woven glowing fiber optic cables. I don't see any fiber optic cables, but more on that in just a second, because um, after that I say recursive fractal patterns and extreme ornaments, light rays and style of Zaha Hadid. Uh, then I give it a, um, a word called discombobulated. I give it a weight of one, and then you can see I change the aspect ratio so it's taller, four to five. So there's a lot going on in that prompt, right? Um, nothing that we haven't talked about except for these colons and these weights. So when you want to put colons in between things um, to sort of separate them uh, out from each other, right? So an example that uh, Midjourney uses quite often um, because we're using words and we, 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 uh, we're hoping that Midjourney can interpret our words and oftentimes it does it in very naive ways, right? Um, so, for instance, if we wanted to use the term hot dog, but we wanted a dog that's actually hot and sweaty, rather than the, the processed food in a bun smothered in relish and, and mustard, then we could separate hot and dog with those double colons, right? So we can separate and put a hard pause between those things so that it doesn't read hot and dog together, um, but actually begins to combine them in its latent space in a different way, sort of thinking about dogs that might be hot. All right. so. Um, when I do that with the word like discombobulated, then um, that's, a, that's another way of sort of giving it a weird or chaos uh, 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 parameter. It sort of throws things off and lets uh, mid-journey sort of really uh, take some artistic liberty and, and start to throw some of these words out and, and, and uh, um, do some, some unexpected things. Um, right, so anyway, that's a long explanation for that one simple prompt. Um, but you can begin to explore and, and really sort of wordsmith your prompts. And I, uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that here in a bit. But um, so here's an example of, of uh, this. This came as a, a set of four and I upscaled it. So now it's on its own, this image. You can see that we have several different options here. First, the first row underneath, we have creating variations are very strong and then very subtle and then very region. Um, and then underneath that, you can see we have things like zooming and then changing the aspect ratio to make square if it's not already a square. And then underneath that, we have arrows, left, right, top, and bottom. So let's talk about each of these individually. Um, let's talk about the, the variation. So we can create variations of this image, right? And very strong means that you're going to get um, images that vary more from the original image. Very subtle means it'll actually use that same seed and a few things might change, a few details, but by and large, you'll still get the same composition and a number of details will be very similar. And then very region, you can actually use a lasso tool and begin to end paint and change just specific regions of the image. So let's take a look at each one. Right, so here's an example of very strong. So I made a, a strong set of variations off of this. You can see that the composition is largely changed. So there's a, a similar aesthetic, a similar uh, pattern, a similar uh, uh, sort of part to whole relationship here, but the overall composition of the image has changed, right? I mean, this is this is actually more symmetrical, whereas the first one was asymmetrical. Um, you know, the, the foregrounds changed, the backgrounds changed uh, in a number of ways, right? So that's if you 
like what you see here, but uh, you want to get more, more results, very strong can actually be kind of an interesting way to iterate um, from an image, uh, again, without having to actually having to, to rewrite the prompt or adjust things, um, you can actually uh, say, well, I like this one, but I want more that um, have the same qualities of, of this, uh, this image, right? Um, very subtle is, is different, right? You can see compositionally, right? The foreground is the same. Compositionally, the midground is the same. You can see this sort of column, something coming down to hitting the ground again. Oops. And then you can see the background is very similar, right? So um, this is where you have an image, um, but something, just one small detail that isn't quite right. Um, sometimes it'll denoise again and again and again using the very subtle. Um, and you can get something that's very close to the original image, but sometimes it fixes some of those weird glitches. And that was really handy, particularly before we had something called very region. So that third option was very by region. Um, here's what it looks like when you click very region. Um, it gives you a box that pops up. You can see the image. And then you have several lasso tools. You have a rectangular lasso tool and then a freehand lasso tool down at the bottom. In this case, I used the freehand lasso tool and you can see there's a blue outline, right? I basically said, I just want to repaint or re, uh, reconfigure um, the image just within this region, right? And then I could actually, uh, uh, what's interesting is you can actually also um, uh, adjust the prompt as needed just to just for that that region, right? So sometimes you you look at an image and go, well, I don't really want that tree there. Or I don't want a human right there. Um, you know, if that was the case and it was that clear cut, then I would probably uh, put a, a dash dash note, a negative prompt, um, a human or a tree out of the, the image when it regenerates that part of the image, right? So let me just show you what, what happens when I just certainly run this prompt. Um, and with this region selected, you can see, right? Really, we're just focusing on this area. And each time it's sort of changed here, we have like three sort of apertures or oculus oculi. Here we have two, here we have one, here it becomes much more solid plus one in the background, right? So it really just focused in on just that region. Everything else should be largely the same, if not completely the same. So that's a way we can start to do in painting within mid journey um, without having to take it into Photoshop or Dolly or uh, one of those others that I had, have had in painting for a while. Right. Um, okay. So the next set of, of tools we'll talk about are zooms. Um, and here's another example. I, I always just use different examples so we can sort of see different um, different prompts. And this is a completely different prompt strategy. This is really just like a sort of word salad. I I didn't try to write any kind of sentences or, or make any sense. I just gave it some words, uh, rhizome, undulating, bifurcating, lattice, urban city. Um, and, uh, and then you can see there's that parameter, right? Aspect ratio, four wide, five parts high. Um, and so this is what I got out as a result. Um, and uh, what you can do is you can begin to zoom, right? You can sort of say, um, this is a really interesting image. What would happen if I could zoom out and get it twice as large or get twice as much area? And so it'll actually generate a fill around the edges, right? And so uh, uh, it, what's interesting is you can, you can zoom out one and a half times, you can zoom out two times, uh, custom zoom, I think you can sort of pick between one and a half and two. I don't think you can zoom out like eight times, right? I think the max is two um, at each step, right? So um, I can zoom out and uh, generate a set of images, uh, options, um, pick one to upscale and then zoom out of that one iteratively. Um, what's interesting about this is you, through that process, you can actually zoom out and zoom out and zoom out and zoom out quite a bit. Um, I liken it to sort of world building. You have a sort of snapshot um, of something that you find is interesting, but you're kind of interested to see what how Midjourney will sort of fill in details and generative fill um, out, 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 out. Um, sometimes it, this comes in really handy. I can't tell you how many times I've tried to um, prompt something. Uh, then the main subject of the uh, the image should be like a car, an automobile, um, or a building, but it cuts off the top or the side of it, right? Um, this case now we can we can actually zoom out and let it sort of fill in the rest. Um, and, and even try to zoom out until the, the actual subject is centered if it wasn't in, inside the composition and recrop if we need to, right? So that comes in really handy. Um, I do this a, a lot uh, sometimes when I get something interesting, um, I'll zoom out and zoom out and zoom out and zoom out in an iterative fashion. Um, and then I'll take those images and, and uh, put them in After Effects and then 
um, for instance, and, and then uh, sort of keyframe them together um, to sort of zoom in or zoom out, sort of a la the sort of Powers of Ten film by Ray and Charles Eames, right? So, um, <laughs> but I think it's kind of interesting, right? This is an example where, uh, you know, I zoomed out quite a bit. Now I'm doing the reverse process. I'm telling the story story where I, I start with the, the furthest zoom out and then zoom in slowly. Um, you can see, you know, here towards the center is that, that original image that I started with. So these are all the results of just continually zooming out. Um, and of course, you could do the, the reverse process. Here's a sort of urban core um, from aerial view, like a satellite photo um, that it, this was sort of the prompt, um, and then slowly zooming out, right? So you can sort of see it as a, it emerges just one sort of sector or neighborhood of a city that's actually sprawling and much larger, right? Huge metropolitan area, a little bit of jumps there in the images, but uh, right. So you can have fun with these. And uh, um, again, you can you can zoom out one and a half times or zoom out two times or anywhere in between uh, in, in the, between one and a half and two in that ratio. You just sort of say custom zoom and you can give it a ratio between one and a half and two. Right, okay. Almost like you're flying away in an airplane. Sorry, I just, uh, let me just put that back. All right, and now, um, here's yet another example where we'll actually look at the pan. So um, we have the arrow left, right, top, and bottom. Um, sometimes instead of zooming out, maybe what we want to do is extend the image to the left or to the right or the top or the bottom. Um, and so uh, what these pan tools let us do is exactly that, right? So here's an image I made. Again, this doesn't quite look like the sort of typical rendered image from uh, mid-journey. I, I think I said architectural cross-section of a neighborhood mechanically shaped pathways, a name drop Zaha Hadid. Um, and then I, I tried to sort of get it to, to make some sort of drawing that might be kind of rendered with marker or pencil or something, um, cutaway section. Um, you can actually use these tools. In this case, I use the left and right arrows to extend this out. Um, so that becomes a sort of widescreen panoramic. So if you can see my cursor right in here is the original image and I pan to the right a couple of times I pan to the left more than a, a few times um, in order to sort of extend the image um, in both directions, right? All right, so I'm not done yet. <laughs> I had a few things this morning, um, but uh, thank you for paying attention. How are we doing on time? Do we have a few more minutes, Neil? Sure, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, great, fantastic. So I did want to talk a little bit about prompting and maybe give a little bit of insight on, on how I approach these things, right? Um, I'll, I'll start by just simply using a very generic, um, a very generic prompt, a tall interior space. If you use something very generic, then expect to get um, uh, maybe something unexpected, not exactly what you were looking for out. Um, so mid-journey is not a mind reader. The more descriptive you can be and the more details you can give it, oftentimes the closer the, the results are to what you what you were um, hopefully asking for, right? So in this case, you say a tall interior space and you get a, a sort of random set of tall interior spaces. They, indeed, you got exactly what you asked for, um, but uh, we can actually become much more um, uh, detailed in this approach. So I have a, a particular framework that I use and um, I'm just gonna share it with you really quickly. Um, this is one of them that I use, uh, especially when I'm looking at um, spatial effects, material effects, uh, and uh, uh, lighting effects, atmospherics. So um, the first set here, I, I sort of call shape, volume, and light. Um, and so again, I just asked myself a series of questions. Um, and then the answers to these questions usually make their way into a prompt in some sort of order. So what kind of space is it? Can I actually label it in some sort of programmatic way? Um, or um, if not, then I could always say who's using the space, right? Like, so I can you know, maybe I don't say artist studio, but I say an artist is actually uh, uh, creating a painting or a dance troupe is performing there, or um, there are people having a cocktail party and standing around talking, et cetera, right? Um, what are geometric characteristics? I can't stress this enough, right? The geometric characteristics of the space um, or form, super important. Um, a lot of those words carry a tremendous amount of weight in the output or the results at the end, right? So. If I say a tall angular interior space, that's gonna have a dramatic effect. I'm gonna see a tall angular interior space um, in the output. If I say a, um, a sprawling cascading, sorry, sorry, a sprawling 
uh, undulating uh, uh, building complex that's uh, cascading down a hillside, that's exactly what I'll see, right? So if you can be descriptive, particularly on, in its relationship to form um, or space or volume, right? Geometric characteristics have a, a tremendous amount of weight um, in the prompt. The kind of lighting and the kind of mood and then any other sorts of objects in the space with the sort of entourage. If you want humans, you can sort of talk about, you know, do I want uh, pedestrians walking around in a bustling streetscape or do I want a, uh, a tree-lined uh, sidewalk or, you know, et cetera, right? You can begin to sort of talk about um, the sorts of other things you want to see in the object, uh, the, in the, the output results. Hot air balloons in the sky, birds flying, you know, or whatever it is. Um, then the next set, deals with surface materials and texture. Sometimes it can be really handy when I'm I'm sort of, uh, you know, sometimes even before I go into the, like to say the wood shop, you know, I, I look for an, an effect and then I, uh, material effect and before I, I go in and try to figure out how I might actually make this. Um, so things I tend to ask are what kinds of surface in their geometry, right? Is it smooth, undulating, supple? Is it angular? Is it hard, uh, uh, harsh, um, textured, right? The kinds of materials and the qualities the materials possess, right? So let's say I was talking about masonry, um, you know, am I talking about heavy masonry? Am I talking about gridded masonry? You know, you can begin to talk about the qualities inside to start to get, um, um, to sort, I guess, influence what gets drawn, what gets prioritized um, visually and the, uh, after the, the uh, images are denoised. Um, the kinds of textures and kind of patterns, right? So if I'm stuck, I, I, I immediately go to some of these um, some of these uh, uh, frameworks, these questions, in order to get my my imagination going again, I start to ask questions. These are questions I would typically ask if I was sitting there with my sketchbook anyway. So I like in this mid, my mid journey space is kind of like a generative sketchbook when I have ideas. Right. One last um, uh, set of questions, right? Scale and frame. So I'm thinking about that camera, and I'm thinking about the overall composition. Um, so what happens sometimes when I I get an interesting result? Uh, in the, the default one by one square format, um, I'll change the aspect ratio and see what happens in a vertical format or a horizontal format. Um, sometimes you get different results. Um, it sort of takes mid journey out of its comfort zone a little bit and, and starts to get uh, um, uh, things stretched out either horizontally or vertically. Who's using the space? You can start to add scale with uh, um, describing, um, let's say humans using the space, you know, you can start talking about the verb. Um, what kinds of objects are in the space? Um, you can even say what kind of camera or what kind of vantage point. Um, I do see prompts, for instance, that go into tremendous amount of detail. Like they'll they'll specify like a, a SLR uh, camera body, uh, a lens length, um, f stop. Right. I will say that those details seem to be lost on Mid Journey oftentimes. Um, but what you can do is give it more general, higher level terms. If you're looking for an extreme depth of field, just say depth of field, right? Rather than trying to give it a low F stop. Um, if, or if you say, um, um, rather than saying 18 millimeter wide angle lens or fisheye lens, you can just say fisheye or wide angle establishing shot or aerial perspective or eye level perspective, right? So you can begin to sort of give it um, some of these more general terms and try to snap it back into whichever, you know, wherever you want that camera to be located looking at whatever you're describing, right? So um, these are some just some quick tips that I found that are really helpful for me. Um, a lot of people always ask me, uh, Neil mentioned on Instagram, there's a pretty active uh, community of folks posting things and asking things. A lot of people ask me like, what was the prompt or how did you come up with that? Um, so I thought maybe I'd, I'd take this time just to give a little bit of insight into that. Um, it's really just a very simple set of questions, a very, very simple framework that I um, that I use. Um, and so anyway, I, I, I think that's it. So I, I've wrapped up. Fabulous. Fabulous, Joshua. That was, that was <clears throat> terrific. I think it was uh, crystal clear, very didactic. That's exactly what I think people need. It's really a wonderful, thorough introduction to Mid Journey. Um, Thank you. <laughs> We can have some. We can have some questions at the end, but I want to move straight on to Sara um, and uh, welcome Sara, um, who is part of Digital Futures team and an architect from uh, Syria. Sara, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm really happy to be uh, today with the Digital Futures AI series once again, 
And I want to thank Joshua for the amazing uh, presentation on my journey, approaching it really differently and professionally. I will start my presentation now. I hope the screen is clear for you. Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. I'll just turn off the camera for to avoid any interruptions. Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, I will be talking uh, today about stable diffusion and I will be specifically talking about Dream Studio Beta. Uh, it is the web interface of stable diffusion, so I will let you know more about it and introduce you to it. First of all, these are um, some of my previous or recent works on different uh, models such as Midjourney and Stable Diffusion. And also here uh, I worked on Stable Diffusion image to image in painting, uh, applying multiple architectural concepts in um, a site that was um, um, already imagined by uh, Stable Diffusion. So to start talking a bit about stable diffusion, it is a latent diffusion model. It's a kind of deep generative artificial neural network. Its code and model ways have been released uh, publicly. So that's uh, really not, did not happen in other models. And it can run on most consumer hardware, hardware equipped with a modest GPU with at least eight gig of RAM. This marked a departure from previous uh, proprietary, uh, pro proprietary text to image models such as DALI and Midjourney and other models. Uh, the development of Stable Diffusion was funded and shaped by the startup company of Stability AI. So this is Stability AI. Um, it's a, the, the company that uh, is um, uh, sponsoring and it has the Stable Diffusion uh, model. And also a part of it is uh, Dream Studio. So to show you the difference of how the model is really developing, uh, this image here was created in Night Cafe Studio uh, with Stable Diffusion Model 1.5. And the image here uh, on the right side, it's created in Night Cafe Studio with Stable Diffusion uh, SDXL Model, which is the latest model that we will be talking about uh, today. So yeah, you can see the huge difference. Uh, we will talk about uh, the model uh, that was announced by Stability AI team earlier this July, which is SDXL1. Um, so to get uh, started and to know more about it, it's the next iteration in the evolution of text to image uh, generation models. Uh, it uh, generates uh, images of high quality in virtually any art style, or um, it's also really good for photorealism. Um, it requires only a few words to create a complex and detailed um, aesthetically pleasing images. So we're not using uh, long uh, complex prompts here because it responds to more simple language or prompts. So to get started with, with this model, we have to know where we can find it, how we can use it. So we can find uh, the model in ClipDrop. You can go directly to, um, I posted the link here. You can go to this link and you can go to Clipboard and visit the link. And also uh, you will uh, um, be able to directly write your prompt and test the images. And it's also, uh, you can find it in GitHub uh, page on Stability AI platform on other platforms, you can find it in this link. So we will be talking um, about the XD, uh, SDXL uh, model in Dream Studio. So uh, to introduce you a bit to Dream Studio, it's a web version of the Stable Diffusion Text to Image Generator. It's similar to DALI 2, but has key differences. It is an open platform with different image control platforms accessible to everyone and currently being developed as well. So Sarah, uh, Sarah, last time in our... Sarah, yeah. can Sorry. you please talk slower, please? Oh, yeah. No, don't need to run too fast. Thank you. Okay, sure. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so uh, I was saying that um, on the last um, AI series uh, we had with Digital Futures, we talked about uh, Dream Studio, but the web interface was completely different. Um, now it's really have a, a new version and it's really developed, so um, we have to experiment and to get you to it. So uh, if you visit this web um uh, web, uh, you know, like this website, if you visit it, you will find, uh, you will go directly to uh, Dream Studio. 
Uh, it has two generators, text to image and image to image. In this tutorial, we will Uh, we will talk about uh, the rapid prompt engineering methods that are um, out of the ordinary. Um, in this tutorial, uh, we will focus on explaining, uh, explaining how stable diffusion work on Dream Studio. We will learn uh, basic, uh, basic methods of uh, prompt um, engineering and rapid creative uh, uh, working with prompts to pr produce architectural delivers and also training on multiple ideas, sharing references. So um, as usual, I like to show you the uh, work, uh, workflow that we will have. We will have to set and then we sorry you you're breaking up slightly um uh, choose the style and the keywords and uh, then sorry, sorry. Okay, i'll try to you, see you, the... we lost the last uh, minute could you maybe just uh, go back sorry you oh, you're sorry. Up. so your connection was um Broke up, oh, okay. okay, I'll just repeat it fast. Um, the last okay. uh, thing I was saying that um, we have to choose the AI model that we want to work on. And then after that, testing the prompt and working on the steps and the strength and then uh, on the image editing. So if we go to beta.dreamstudio.ai, we will uh, go uh, directly to the web interface of uh, Dream Studio. Uh, we will find a lot of new things and uh, we can start uh, directly working on it. We have to create an account on Dream Studio. Uh, whenever you create an account or log in with your Google um, account, you will get a 25 uh, free credits that you can experiment with. But uh, since the new um, model is uh, like it needs a lot of steps to produce images, which is not a lot. It's It costs so um, less, so I will show you how. Okay, so now we will start. This is the most important part of Dream Studio. This is the Generate Studio, where you can choose the style, the prompt, you write your prompt, the negative prompt, and the dream um, is the most important thing after we finish all the settings. Um, it is where it all starts uh, to construct the prompt that we already uh, wrote. Uh, so when you go to your account, um, it's really important that you visit the prompt guide and read about it because it's really important explaining how we can deal uh, with uh, this model and how we can make uh, images close to our prompts. So also it's important to visit the, uh, to see the pricing table and how um, stable diffusion um, work with credits uh, to know uh, how much uh, your image is costing you in, in terms of credits and in terms of, uh, you know, the, the money that you're paying for the subscription. Um, so if you subscribe, you will have to pay only uh, $10 and amazing images. Um, okay, so the next thing that um, I will talk about is uh, here well, where you can write your prompt. Uh, the negative prompt is here we can find settings similar to what Joshua explained in Midjourney, but um, in a different way. Uh, so the negative prompt, you just have to write one word, which, which is the element that you want to exclude from your image. Um, and you can uh, also uh, choose the aspect ratio um, for your image, and you can also write your image sizes uh, in a custom way. This is a new in uh, Dream Studio. Um, okay, so yeah, uh, the tip also that I want to tell you is um, you can generate up to 10 images for one prompt, but I recommend that you start with one image 
for each prompt to test if this prompt is effectively giving you the result that you want or not, uh, because, you know, like 10 images will cost a lot of credits for you. Also, the style is very important. I usually work with cinematic uh, for um, the architectural um, outcomes, but you can use whatever style you want. Um, also here in the advanced uh, section, if you press on it, you will have this um, uh, list. It has the width and the height of the image that you can set by yourself, as we said. The prompt strength is really important because it shows uh, how the prompt, uh, the uh, model responds to your prompt. The generation steps is also really important because it gives your image accuracy, but also this is related to the um, uh, to the prompt that you write, whether it's complex or not. The seed, you can, uh, each image have its own seed, which is a number that you can um, add to any image that you are doing, because each image have its own seed and you can get uh, a seed of a previous image and use it on another image. So uh, the model, you can press here and choose from different models, but we are like um, experimenting with SDXL version one and the previous version of it as well. So uh, yeah, we talked about the prompt strength. Yeah, one more thing is that the prompt strength is high. You will get a repetitive image. You will get an irregular architectural outcomes if the this number is high. Uh, if it was medium and the generation steps was high and your prompt is have a lot of complexities, then it will be um, probably good to give you um, a good result, but not more than 10, because uh, it's not really trained much as mid journey on architectural outcomes. Um, yeah, so the thing that I want to say also about the model, if you press here, you will see those different models. We will work on this model, but also I have tested with the previous one, and it really shows good accuracy in regard to um, architectural details and also material. Okay, so, so we have covered those as well. Okay, so this is, you know, like an, um, a reminder that you will have to define your idea as an architect and you'll start to experiment with those tools. If you are experimenting with them for the first time, you will really um, um, just produce whatever concept comes into your mind, but also you have to specify a specific concept to test whether this model is giving you the results that you want or not. Uh, so in this tutorial, we will work on three ideas on side villa on an intervention on existing facade and also an intervention real another building, building, a building Sarah, of a Sarah, one more thing your is voice is break sad can you go back please your voice is breaking we can hear anything from the last slide the previous slide please oh, i don't know why is this happening okay so yeah, what I was uh, saying is um, I was talking about those three ideas that we, we will work on in this tutorial, uh, the seaside villa, the intervention on existing facade, and also an intervention on a real uh, scattered building or a building that lost a part of it. Uh, and we will focus on, a form, the, uh, on the form, the material, and the design. Um, Okay, so I hope my voice is clear. I will try to um, say as brief as possible. Uh, specify result to what you want. You can also uh, say wide angle or wide wide exposure if you want to get um, a specific wide Sarah, angle. Sarah, sorry again. This this slide now you can you went um, mute. So please start over this one, please. Your connection is not very good, so sometimes it breaks. I'll let okay. you know when it breaks. Yeah, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
okay what's your angle and um the angle of view for example a perspective the metric aerial view top view whatever you want to show uh you can also use uh chat gpt to help you writing the prompt uh but um for stable diffusion uh, you have to really work on the prompt after you get it from chat gpt because stable diffusion does not understand um, a lot of complex words a lot of language so you need to uh, reframe your prompt uh, so the model understands what you are uh, typing so the first idea um that we uh that we will work about is the seaside villa uh, so also, again, I recommend you to visit the prompt guide and also to read about those six elements that I will uh, talk about, which are the core prompt, the style, the architect or the artist, finishing touches and prompt weightening and the negative prompting. Uh, pretty much uh, similar to, um, again, to mid-journey, but are different here in Stable Diffusion Dream Studio. So the first example uh, prompt is a hyper-realistic aerial view of a villa community by the sea, designed by Anthony Gaudi, with multiple forms, made from glass in the style of gesture-driven, dramatic diagonals, urban energy, and then 8K, dramatic, beautiful, post-processing, and then uh, centered. I will explain what is this. So a hyper-realistic aerial view of a villa community by the sea is the core prompt. So this is the most important part of the prompt that the model will focus on. And then the style, uh, we have explained that um, uh, it have uh, um, the style of gesture driven, a dramatic style. And then the architect is Anthony Gaudi. And then the finishing touches are 8K dramatic post-processing. Those are really important to mention. Uh, for the prompt weightening, for example, I want to uh, the image to be centered. I want the image to be in the center um, uh, or the element to be in the center of the image. So uh, you can simply simply uh, combine between two uh, things, which is post-processing. Um, if you type one, this is the default number of uh, the prompt weight. Uh, which which will um, try to make it uh, post uh, processing and in a very good way. And then if you uh, draw this, um, you know, like icon, it, it's in, on the keyboard, and then you type centered, and then you type one, so you have um, a balanced uh, image. So we will um, see now what we will get. This is the uh, the first basic result we have. Um, it's not really clear, but we have um, the community of uh, the villas are in the center of this uh, composition of this island. Um, we have we I have generated one image because this uh, I'm not really sure of this uh, prompt. So let's move to the next one. This is a similar prompt, but I have um, changed with the prompt weightening of the center. I have made it uh, 0.5, which means that I don't really necessarily want the uh, main object of the um, of the prompt to be in the center of the image. So we can see that it's a bit on the left side. Um, so this one. Uh, I will read it from here. Uh, this one is a hyper-realistic, demetric perspective view of a futuristic modern villa. Um, it has a spiral composition, a beautiful coral reefs with parametric facade from limestone, Gaudi style. And then I have added those, uh, you can see those finishing touches, the post-production, real details. And also I try to uh, balance the image somehow to make it um, have a real details and also centered and it's really important that you choose your style um, to make the image more uh, realistic in here we have choose for the prompt strength to be five and the steps to be 20 so we are seeing that the image is starting to give a good result but it's not really developed so we will see the next one okay so the next one have a similar prompt um, uh, except that i have specified that i don't want to see people um, and also I have uh, made the steps higher because the prompt is complex. So if we have a higher steps, this will help us to get a better results. And also I have made the prompt strength to 10. It was five in the previous one. So I get um, more um, complex and more beautiful result, if we want to say. 
Okay, so um, this is another example. Um, we can see that uh, the prompt is really uh, close to the previous one, uh, but also with a different number of steps. I have made the steps very high. So whenever you make the steps really high, you will have always to remember the balance because you will not really get 100% what you were um, aiming from the prompt because I have this villa it's kind of nice but the perspective is not really good so always we have to focus on the balance between those two uh, prompt strength and also the steps here I have specified that I want uh, this same prompt to be at night so I put it in the prompt waiting um, uh, next to it we have specified that I wanted uh, for uh, mostly a night uh, perspective and also um, uh, we have a high steps and a high prompt strength but I get a better result from uh, the previous image um, also one more thing if you want to download your image you can press here and you can download the image you can upscale it um, up to uh, two times uh, this thing is also new on um, this model. It wasn't there before. Uh, so the quality of the images are getting better. This one is also an example for a similar prompt, but with different steps and with different prompt strengths. So this is um, the same prompt, but with uh, different steps and different prompt uh, strengths. So in the previous one, the prompt strength was 20. And here it's 10. So I have a sunset uh, perspective, not a, a night perspective. And uh, for the same concept, here's another example. Um, also, the idea that I, I'm talking about is the steps and the prompt strength, because I have removed the night scene and I have removed some parts, uh, um, unnecessary part of uh, the, uh, the prompt. I will read it back again, a hyper-realistic aerial top view of a parametric futuristic gothic villa made from timber and glass by the sea designed by Anthony Gaudi with fluid forms dramatic diagonals linear lead lights 8k dramatic realistic beautiful so um, I have a high number of steps and a possibly medium number of prompt strength so I get a better uh, result this one is also similar, but with different prompt strength and different steps. So you can play with the same prompt and um, play with the prompt strength and different steps. But as I told you, that prompt strength shouldn't be very high for accurate results. So um, I have changed the perspective or view of uh, the same prompt. I have added a dimetric perspective view of the futuristic modern villa. Um, uh, probably um, this is, will improve more. I'm working on stable diffusion model um, SDXL1. This one is really different. I did a lot of uh, new things. So I will explain to you. This is the uh, probably the same um, prompt. Um, I have used the previous version of SDXL um, um, model. It's 0 0.9. And I have added a seed of a previous image that I did that have a perforated facade. Uh, so I added those to changes to the image. And I think I, I'm starting to get a bit of details that I wanna see in this uh, villa. So, and uh, possibly I specified it that I want uh, to be from gold, so it's good. And I have uh, figured out um, in uh, experiments with the images that this model is better with materials than the advanced um, and the latest model. So this is the same prompt with timber the same exact prompt with glass, um, the same exact prompt with limestone, and the same prompt with uh, gold. So I'm or metal. So I'm changing with um, the materials. Uh, so also, I want to show you how changing the aspect ratio can affect uh, the the image. So this is the same prompt, but I have uh, changed the aspect ratio for two images, and look how. Uh, much different results that we have. Uh, probably we're getting the same material, um, the same composition somehow, but um, it's, it really responds to um, how much they want to show you um, from the beautiful part of the prompt in each aspect ratio. 
So to move now to the other part of uh, the interface of Dream Studio, which is the edit part. Um, it's really fun to work with this one, uh, this um, uh, place where you can upload your image and work on it. And remember, whenever you see this colorful uh, frame, this means that everything inside this frame is being imagined and created by the uh, AI. So there's no, if you left any missing part of this uh, rectangle, you'll, you'll, you will uh, get results from AI. So uh, to introduce you more to this, uh, you can upload here any image that you want. You can um, erase parts of it and replace it with the new prompts and new elements. You can download the image and you can add um, also, as we said, the, uh, your image. It also have the similar settings um, like the generate part. Um, this is the part where uh, also you have to write your prompt. You can use the eraser to work on the image. And here in this part, uh, this is where your prompt being, um, this is the layer of your prompt um, or the AI layer on the image that you are uploading here. So let's talk about a new prompt that we will uh, work on, a hyper-realistic 3D printed parametric facade made from limestone um, uh, using reconstruction methods and then the finishing touches, HD and real details. This is a simple prompt. So we will see what it does to the image. This is a real image my friend have taken to um, a scattered building. I always think of how we can uh, fill the gaps in scattered buildings and what we can do. And this remains in my imagination. So AI is a really helpful tool so you can figure some ideas. Uh, so yeah, as I told you about the eraser, I think I have explained about this. Okay. So what the eraser does is that whenever you upload your image, you choose the blur and the, the strength of your eraser and you try to erase parts of your image and then you replace it with, a, with whatever prompt that you want. But you have to always consider that you'll have to try the prompt once and twice and, and, and see if it really works with the image. And always remember that uh, don't make the eraser strength very strong. Otherwise, the, the real um, image will be covered with a lot of odd elements. So this was to imagine how 3D printing can cover a scattered building and fill the gaps. And OK, those are other examples. Here I talked about limestone facades. And here I talked about more facades made from limestone. So we can made um, or generate a lot of ideas from this editing um, tool. Also the last uh, prompt that, uh, or the last idea that I will work on, um, it's a colorful uh, parametric illuminated glass facade designed by Calatrava with linear LED lights. Um, uh, and then I finished with the uh, finishing touches such as 4K, 8K, realistic, high quality. Um, and also harmony for style, and I have chosen a night environment. So we have the all elements together, except of the last two. Okay, so this is an image that I done previously by Midjourney. So I didn't like the facade, or I think I want to develop something with it. So I thought of how, uh, what about to move it to Dream Studio and work a bit on it. So uh, you press here and then you upload this image and then it's here uploaded. And as I told you, uh, everything that left blank in this um, rectangular uh, will be generated by AI. So they will generate a sky for you. They will generate uh, the ground. They will change the facade. So I chosen to left the central part of the facade as it is to see how we can make um, iterations out of it. So you choose the size of the eraser to play with it here, the blur and the strength. And also this is where you write the prompt. So as you can see, I have generated a lot of iterations out of this. Um, those colors are, um, I specified that I wanted to be colorful. Maybe I can also uh, control um, the color um, I want to, to show in this image, but it shows a lot of um, beautiful iterations for the same uh, composition that I did not accept or imagine. 
Uh, one important thing also in this um, edit uh, tool, the image is uh, in a small size, but after you download it, or if you want to download it, you can upscale it and uh, you will get better images. So to sum everything up um, so far, because I think the model is really developing, if you have a short prompt, you have to specify the, the view, whether it's perspective or top or the metric, the interior or exterior, the architect name really helps. And also um, to, uh, do, uh, to add a medium prompt strength and a high steps to have a good result. Uh, for the other example, uh, if you have a short prompt uh, and specify the view, the interior exterior architect name um, and specify the materials uh, you will have to uh, use the previous um, uh, model of uh, sdxl stable diffusion to uh, respond more to materials and uh, details so you get a more accurate result the last one is specifying the same possible things that i talked about and also adding the finishing touches you will have um also to add a low prompt strength and a high steps and then you will get a better balance and a good result of the image those are some good and useful um references that i can also add um, to the youtube video and this is possibly the end of my tutorial thank you so much i hope it was helpful i hope the sound was good also Thanks, Sarah. Um, we had a few glitches on, on the sound, but I think that uh, uh, it should be clear enough. It, thank you for such a crystal clear presentation anyway, in terms of uh, how you describe things. That was uh, following on from Joshua. We had some, I mean, fantastic. Both of them incredibly good. Um, Sarah, you need to become a professor. You need to become a professor. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, we've got some a little time now for some questions. Um, so anybody who is on YouTube, if you'd like to um, send us some questions, maybe there are some there already. Maybe one of the team can just check for that. Um, uh, maybe I could just, uh, while we're waiting, just maybe ask um, Joshua and, and, and Sarah um, just to sum up really what has happened in the last six months, because we had a, a series of tutorials, of course, back in February and March. What would you say, um, let's start with Joshua first, what would you say is the key difference of what's 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 changed? Of course, we've got DALI 3 that just appeared in the last uh, few days, but um, yeah. Right. So I would say um, some of those uh, generative AI apps like Midjourney, uh, Stable Diffusion came out with a new version, SDXL, of course, that Sarah, Sarah was just talking about. Um, there are uh, now some pretty fairly sophisticated, they have a lot of promise um, apps and, and products that will uh, start to generate video. Um, and, and by um, <clears throat> and as a result, start to, to sort of build in a three-dimensional logic um, to a flat image, right? So suddenly you can pan around it and sort of see it in the round or or have it sort of transform. Um, on the mid-journey front, uh, you know, it, it's it, they've actually added a bunch of new features and tools to try to help you post-process. -pro um, so once you get uh, an image uh, out, uh, if you have small quirks in it that you want to you um, uh, change or fix, you can. Um, and of course, Adobe, I, I feel it's sort of playing catch up here. So Photoshop, um, the latest version, a full version of Photoshop 2024, not the beta version, now has the generative fill and the uh, remove tools. Um, so uh, Adobe is trying to trying to move into this space, back into the space. And, and uh, so it's kind of an interesting time, right? I think a lot of companies are competing for our eyes. Um, and I think we're winners in that, that arms race, right? There's lots of tools at our disposal. I mean, yeah, of course, and also LookX has just opened up. In fact, I don't know if you know Indeed. this, they're registered in Las Vegas. Um, so they're a completely Western company. So Fantastic. Uh... <laughs> I love that. Yeah, actually, I have my students uh, experimenting with that right now. They're taking model photo sketches, re-rendering them, changing the scale. It, it's actually, uh, they're really ahead in, the, in, that, in that space right now. It's, it's actually fascinating to watch. And it's interesting you mentioned uh, Refik a couple of times in the intro. Right down the the street from me, we have this gigantic sphere, and yeah. his generative work is actually on display, at like ten stories tall, on this uh, gigantic sphere, three sixty. Wow! Wow! Just for one question for you, Joshua. I mean, I I don't know. It's I mean, I've noticed that 
Mid Journey is getting better. Now, the funny thing is they haven't released um, version six. They were talking about releasing it about two or three months ago, but it never came out. And I'm just wondering whether five version 5.2, whether you think it's been kind of tweaked as we're going along. I mean, certainly I think that some of the the faces that we're getting generated are, are just much, much better quality. Um, we're still getting glitches on you know, six fingers and so on, but but yeah. some of the, 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 the standard just seems to be going up and up. And I don't know whether it's, it's internal tweaking or whether it's a different version or what, or whether it's just my prompt. I don't know, maybe. Anecdotally, I, I feel the same way, right? I, I can't really point to anything that they've said. Um, and we've been waiting. It feels like three months ago they were sort of anticipating a new release. It's we've been waiting for a while. It's kind of interesting to sort of see maybe if they're they're holding back to try to really push it forward. But I agree. Yeah, I mean they've come a long way. Um, you can actually do some fairly fairly photorealistic stuff now in in uh, Mid Journey. Of course, uh, what everybody liked about Mid Journey. Model three was that it wasn't photographic. It had a sort of painterly effect. Now we've we've sort of grown past that. So yeah, it's it's really interesting. I don't I don't know how they're adjusting things or or how much our input uh, affects affects things in real time or iteratively versus when they when they re-release a new model. So they're really kind of coy on that stuff. And of course they're a company, so they can be. Um, but uh, it is it does feel anecdotally like it, it sort of improves um even between the, the different version releases like it, it's learning something from us um which it should right i mean it's, it's going to learn from us anyway so um sarah would you like to comment yeah sure um what i think is that um really it developed a lot in terms of understanding architectural compositions and concepts and materials and we're seeing a lot of amazing outcomes out of the, these uh, trained AI models. So I think also the people behind those models are really interested in architectural outcomes. And I think it's uh, the architecture is a trend now in AI, especially that we're seeing a lot of conferences and uh, physical uh, big conferences for architecture and AI in these uh, past six months. And it's really interesting that that means that there's an international interest uh, from all types of people, not just architects in this uh, aspect so um that's really developing very fast yeah i mean the whole kind of aec industries um clearly very interested in it so uh, we, we just have, we have sorry? a couple of questions yes, yes I, I was looking at the first one um so i don't know how to pronounce his name jessica uh, uh, uh zukowski uh it certainly sounds polish i got this maybe the, the, the family name right does it understand context like if i upload an image and asked to populate with entourage. Maybe I can put that to Joshua, but let me say something first of all. Um, and that is that, that actually it is completely based on context in the, the sense that the data is embedded in a certain context. Now, you find that out. I found this out, actually, when I used a prompt and I used the term house extension. I've got somebody back in the UK said, well, why don't you use the term? I use the term house extension. Can I add? Let me finish. Okay, let me finish. Uh, then I, the, and what I noticed was that I got British architecture and I got gloomy weather. I mean, two things that come from the UK. And then I discovered that the term house extension is actually a British expression. It's not something that um, uh, is used in the States, for example. Uh, and so that was what was happening. But you also found, and I I sometimes do this deliberately, I actually use the name of um, an artist who, for example, has very beautiful colours in their paintings, but also comes from a place like Australia. Now, as soon as you do that, you get the most incredible Australian sunshine and you get the kind of uh, landscape that's like the outback because it, it brings with it all the associations of the original. Or indeed, if you use the name of uh, an Inuit artist from the Northern Canada, um, uh, you just you describe a building then you mention this artist, you will get a building with snow around it. So it, it is contextual. It's bringing with it associations, which of course makes the whole logic of prompt engineering much more 
complex than, than, than we first imagined. In fact, the term engineering is maybe a bit of a misnomer. We're talking about alchemy. It is so complex and so and, and, and so mixed up. But that notion of associations, of, of, of thinking through association, is exactly the way that actually human beings think. In other words, if we see uh, a, a red uh, hob on a, a, a ring on a, on a cooker, uh, we don't touch it because we associate red with heat. So it, it's kind of similar to the way that we operate, but but the context in terms of, of, of the, the data used in the prompt is definitely contextual. But maybe Josh, you could, you could comment on that in terms of- uh... Can I just complement one thing that I stood uh, uh, another question, uh, which is about consistency. And uh, it's about majority, how could I save the shape of the building from the image? Oh, no, sorry, the the uh, Jacob, before yes. that, can we just get, get yeah. Josh to comment on that first question? Oh, so, yeah, but, uh, okay. I just wanted to that, that question yeah, okay. go along with consistency. Oh. Yeah, yeah, let's finish the first question first. Joshua? The one sure. if we upload an image and then ask it to populate with entourage. Does that understand context? What do you want to say? Because yeah, I mean, it, it depends, right? It's not a mind reader, um, but you can you can basically load up um, subtle references in in your prompts, um, and and you'll see you'll see um, references to let's say like 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 Neil mentioned, right? You say Scandinavia, and suddenly you get uh, conifer forests and snow and aurora borealis in the sky, etc. Right? Like uh, or in certain place names have uh, I think a disproportionate effect on the end results, right? Um, so it, it seems like for whatever reason, when you you name drop a place like Rome or Barcelona or Hong Kong or Tokyo, um, you get very specific aesthetics out um, dealing with either the urban fabric or the architecture or specific architects, right? So going in the reverse fashion, if you if you um, Neil mentioned sort of uh, naming a, a designer, an artist, or artistic movement from a particular place, and you start to get more qualities from that place. Um, it, it works in the other direction too, sometimes depending on its training data and how often um, somebody or something actually appeared appeared there. So it's actually really interesting. And I liken it to sort of mining for these sort of associations too. Sometimes you just test things out or you look at the results and go, that was weird. I didn't anticipate that. Then you start to put two and two together as you start to look at the, the text you actually wrote and, and sort of see, you know, there is a logic behind it somehow, uh, the logic of association, right? So... I mean, just to, just to follow up from that, I mean, one thing I think just to, to point out, it, it should be fairly obvious, but if you want to specify or name an architect, you need to have an architect with an unusual name who is all over the internet. That's why Zaha Hadid is good or Bjark Ingels is good, but someone called John Smith, it won't work, right? Um, so uh, no, there are certain limitations of that. I mean, just another kind of comment that comes out of your response, Joshua, is, and that is to say, you know, you put in these things and, and and something comes out and you say, that's interesting. And, and you kind of go down a rabbit hole, but it's not what you wanted, but you kind of go, you follow it through, you know, and, and from that point of view, it opens up possibilities. But if you want to try and control it to do precisely what you want it to do, it actually is not that well behaved. And, and you tend to be taken in certain directions that, I mean, a mid journey is is and I, can't, I don't don't use Dali, so just mid journey. Mid journey is particularly good at, at, at doing certain things like um, inflatables or puff jackets. I mean, <laughs> the whole place is inundated with inflatables, right? It drives me crazy to be honest, but nonetheless, we get lots of those. But there's some things that you cannot do. I mean, I tried uh, the Mrs. Barcelona Pavilion; it actually worked quite well. I never got a replication of. The Barcelona Pavilion itself. It never copies. It gives you infinite variations, uh, permutations, kind of using the shape grammar, but never that itself. But nonetheless, it was quite productive. I tried using the Sydney Opera House and it was horrible. It just didn't work. So, so it's kind of interesting. You follow the affordances of the tool itself and you go down these rabbit holes, which is great for exploration, but it, it's not very good if you want to design something very precisely. So, so that's why it comes to the other question was about consistency. And, and, and maybe it would be good to, to have Sarah and Joshua talk about uh, comparing the models uh, because uh, maybe mid-journey doesn't have that much uh, control over consistency and, uh, and stable diffusion does because you can erase and, and put things. So uh, the, the, the other question, uh, which I think uh, have to do with this is about mid-journey. How could I save the shape of the building from well, the image uh, uh, uploaded? 
let's let's deal with the consistency one first one by one yeah, yeah but that's the same thing i'm just connecting questions uh it, it, this person wants to know how could I save the shape of the building from the image I uploaded and make little changes such as a change in the facade it always modifies the whole image so it is about consistency how can I keep things on the image on mid journey or uh, compared to stable diffusion and change it and, and control of changing specific things and I think there is a difference between models so maybe it would be good for them to talk about it yeah yeah, absolutely. Um, for stable diffusion, as I showed you, there's uh, in the edit part, you upload your image or whether it's a, um, an image from a real building or an AI generated building, and then you can erase parts of it. Um, that's what's different in stable diffusion. If you erase this part, there is um, also you can control the blur uh, and the strength of the brush that you are using. So whenever the brush is strong, um, the whole part of the image will be completely erased and replaced with something that is not really connected. If you make the brush um, uh, strong, strength uh, a bit less, then you will get a connected results to the same uh, exact building or facade that you uploaded. So you have um, a good control for the images using the edit uh, image to image tool in um, Stable Diffusion Dream Studio. So I definitely recommend that you try to do this and you can also uh, regenerate uh, the same image um, for multiple times and try for the same building. Joshua, about me journey is not not that precise. I just don't have the seed sure. control, right? You never know. What's yeah, it's out, definitely different than stable diffusion um, and Dolly too. Dolly's had in pain, out pain for a while. Um, I mean, mid journey does let you do some touch ups like that now, not with as much nuance as stable diffusion. So you have that vary by region, um, and you can sort of lasso tool um, areas and and begin to rerun the prompts. And just affect certain certain regions or areas of the image or certain parts of the image. Um, <clears throat> whereas before, I would either look at um, which diffusion model I'm using and see if they actually have that capability, or or take it to Photoshop. Photoshop has that capability as well now. So, um, it again, it's interesting to sort of see how these workflows sort of rearrange themselves, and things are moving really quickly. So, um, <clears throat> uh, it, it's a uh, how do I put it? But but the larger issue here when it comes to precision, right? These are just flat images. They're, they they often don't have a complete three-dimensional coherence or logic to them. In fact, the, the longer you stare at them um, and, and the closer you stare at them, sometimes you see some of the logical fallacies. Um, so it's very good at drawing these things, even though it really has never been to Oslo. It's never, it doesn't know what a brick is. It hasn't had a conversation with a brick like Louis Kahn. You know, it's just, it doesn't really know what these things are, even though it can draw them with, with frightening speed, right? And it, it, which is really fascinating, right? Um, it still speaks to that we, as humans, we still have to sort of curate and 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 uh, sort of look at these things with a critical eye. I've I've got a question for both Sarah and Joshua. First, of all, just a quick observation. I think just in terms of of consistency, I mean, taken in a different sort of way. I mean, one of the challenges when you're dealing with these platforms is that they, whatever they generate, there's no connection between one and the next. You know, you can do an interior, no connection with the exterior, you do the next one. And that's the real challenge. There's no connection between east, west, south, north elevation, which is precisely one of the things that Daniel Bolojan is trying to do in his work with Coop and Oblan. Um, <clears throat> but I just wanted to maybe raise this question. I mean, just taking an overview. Now, Mid Journey has just had its first birthday, you know, a couple of month, a month, months ago. Um, and Really, the kind of the story of how these have, 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 have moved on and changed is kind of interesting because, you know, to begin with, Mid Journey was quite distinctive from Dali because Dali would give you a very precise response, whereas Mid Journey would allow you to kind of iterate and iterate and iterate and iterate. And was, was I don't do the iteration so much these days, but, but that was the way that it operates. And I somehow, because of that, I got locked into Mid Journey. I did try Dali, didn't find it very satisfactory. But you know what? Uh, in terms of these models, um, which one do you think the best? I mean, Josh, you've been talking about Mid Journey, but but which one do you think is? How would you evaluate them overall? But like, maybe ask Sarah as well. That's tough because they have different capabilities. So, Sarah, do you want to go first? I'll, I'll turn it over to you. I, I talked a lot. You go first. You go first. Well, um, so 
you know, they all have their different capabilities and they all have their different flavors. Um, but uh, 100%, I mean, I like Mid Journey, um, but it's because I'm not necessarily trying to produce one coherent building, piece of architecture, plaza, interior space, right? Um, so you're spot on in, in the, the sort of um, consistency, right? Like you're every time you re-roll, it's, it's rolling the dice. It's like, it's like Las Vegas down the street. Oh, um, yeah, so, yeah, I will. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, go for it. Josh, we can... Yeah. Yeah, I, I think like um mid journey is is really amazing because it creates hyper realistic images with epic scenes and a lot of things that you cannot imagine. <clears throat> I think stable diffusion model is really developing because it's not only on Dream Studio. It's uh, uh, there's a lot of ways you can uh, approach uh, stable diffusion and you can get a really great control of it using control net, for example. So there's a lot of great things that stable diffusion does. But I think that if I want to make a specific and a very specific edits to an image and add an element to a realistic image, I will go definitely to uh, Dream Studio. If I want to produce a completely really amazing great concept with a great context and realistic details uh, because i would go to mid journey so i think that navigating between models is really important and it's really important to understand how each model works uh, that would be so much fun and also to be ready for the next generation of models because there will be more of than stable diffusion dali or mid journey i mean just one question i think it's probably the back of everyone's mind even though no one's asked this and that is What's the difference in cost between these different models? Um, Mid Journey, I think, is thirty dollars a month. I think it is. I'm not quite sure. Dali. Mid Journey the... can you can pay ten dollars for a, a lesser amount of generations or twenty. I guess I don't know or ten or twenty or thirty. There's a difference. And then uh, you can pay others, and have yeah. a certain number of GPU hours, or you can pay and have an unlimited number of GPU hours. Yeah, right. On a month monthly subscription basis. I guess for those those getting started, which is the cheapest model? Is there is there any model that's free? Have All of them have uh, some free generations that, that you can try. So just to see yeah. what what is best for you, I guess it depends on what you want, as they were saying. And one thing that might be good and uh, also is to exchange between models. You know, take one thing to the other model, mid journey to stable diffusion or to Dali, and, and go back and forth. Mm -hmm. But uh, they have a, a lot of free generations. That runway mm -hmm. has a lot of free generations at the, the at the beginning. Stable diffusion is open source, and there is an executable you can download and run for free locally on your machine. Uh, it just requires uh, more money up front to, to get that the hardware right. You have to have a screaming fast video card. The minimum eight gigabytes of VRAM, uh, at least. I mean, it's, it's the the more you have, the better. But you can uh, use otherwise, Google you're, you're paying for time well. on people's servers. Yeah. You know, you you, have, you can use Google Collab and uh, Stable Diffusion, but if you sure. want faster, yeah, you, you have to, to pay Google Collab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that uh, maybe that comes to our, our other question, uh, uh, new about training uh, or the, uh, the the models. Which models allow you to train the data set or fine tune the data set? Which comes, to, I guess, to stable diffusion or runway or other tools? Maybe you can comment. Yeah, well, um, stable diffusion allows you that, doesn't it? Um, sorry, am I wrong? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I think um, um, Daniel talked about that um, in a previous talk in Digital Futures about how uh, models been trained. Um, yeah, but absolutely, yeah, you can train the models using um, stable diffusion, but I think it's um, a bit of a complex process that needs a lot of input uh, data and a lot of uh, um, iterations and work processes. There are a lot of LoRa models available. They're yeah. already trained that you can pick from and then add your own uh, images. And uh, there are a, a, a different models like uh, Runway. They have this uh, thing that you can um, train and use. The, I, I haven't used it, but th there are some options. Yeah, Steve, Dream Studio has a lot of different flavors. Um, and, and look, X was mentioned. Um, you know, I think with uh, a little bit of uh, some extra credits, you can you can basically upload forty or fifty of your own images and try to make your own um, fine tune model or Lara model. Um, <clears throat> with mid journey, you're, you're really constrained to just sort of adding, um, image, image prompts at the beginning of the prompt. And there, they really are, um, they're not really training a model. 
um, they're, they're just become style references, style guides. Uh, it, actually, uh, is, is LookX free? I think it is, right? They have free credits and then you have to pay. Yeah, I guess- but a lot of, a hundred free credits, I think. Right, okay. But one of the things about LookX is it is trained on architecture, specifically trained on architecture, um, which which makes it mm -hmm. kind of a certain advantage. I also think they're not going to be sued for copyright because it's done in China where the copyright doesn't really operate. But uh, even within the larger sort of model, LookX model, I mean, they have fine-tuned models for, um, let's say, drawings and plan versus, uh, you know, making something look like it's a, a physically built uh, study model of make, versus making it look like a, a, a fully realized uh, rendering with actual materials and scale. So th there's lots of different flavors to these things. And yeah, you can get a lot of these. I mean, I look X is one where you can get under the hood. Um, you can actually make your own your own um, training set. So, can maybe I just pick up on that? There's a comment, the question here. I'm not quite sure from Fatma uh, Sarikawa. Uh, um, do you think it possible for AI would be able to draw these images in the future? I mean, um, I guess it's possibly generated. I'm not quite sure. Or does uh, or suggest how installation or construction could be done. Well, one of the things I think that, that, that we, we don't know about fully because it's been developed right now, there's certain softwares that have been developed, especially by, I know by LookX, I've got to say that because uh, my new host is one of my doctoral candidates. But I mean, uh, but a lot of this information is not available. It's all kind of hidden under sort of um, uh, non-disclosure agreements and understandably so because there's competition out there so we don't know really know what's happening all i would say is expect in two or three years time that certainly the whole construction process as i can try to mention will be fully automated the question about would it be able would ai be able to draw these images in the future i'm not quite sure what that question is but if you're saying um will it because it does draw the images, but does it, will it do it or uh, be able to do it autonomously? I mean, that's maybe an interesting kind of question because um, at the moment, I mean, I suspect that we've seen how, for example, you know, the news you get on your phone is it's the bots which are kind of recording what you're interested in and adverts and God knows what. It's all, we they know it, right? And uh, Amazon knows what books you like and Spotify knows what music you like. I don't think it's going to take too long before it'll have hacked into our kind of uh, aesthetic um, predilections or, or preferences and be able to sort of say, here's one you might like or make suggestions, as it were. So um, if that's what was behind the question, then uh, I think eventually it will be able to do that. Josh, what do you, what is, what do you, how do you interpret that question? Yeah, I mean, another way of interpreting that is maybe... Um... You know, current construction, you, you you produce a set of drawings, a set of documents, right? Um, I think there's no doubt that that's that's something that can be continually automated, right? Uh, and hopefully that that frees us up to do, you know, more important conceptual things with architecture, right? So um, there's certainly lots of things that need architecting, um, and if we're freed from the sort of mundane tasks, uh, the optimist in me sort of wants to believe that we can we can start to architect and design lots of things. And the pessimist? <laughs> the pessimist. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, you know, there is there is this idea that uh, there's this idea of of uh, cutting costs and overhead and labor, right? So, um, you know, if if something uh, can can be automated that took fifty people to do and only takes ten people or eight people or even one person to do one person plus uh, an AI model, um, then that can, that can have some, some issues with labor, right? Um, the savviest will, will always come out on top and, and, and be there doing amazing things, right? So. Yeah, but maybe I should just mention that tomorrow we have a session, there's a series on Sunday, on Sundays, for the next five weeks um, uh, on the dark side of AI. And I'm going to be talking mm. tomorrow with the same uh, Digital Futures link for tomorrow, um, which is you know it it, it 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 well I won't say more, but there is a there is a dark side to things or potential dark side because of the capabilities, frankly, of this tool. Sarah, do you want to comment at all on how you anticipate the future? What AI is going to be able to do in the future?
Oh, I think Sarah might be frozen. Um, okay. Um, well, I think we can we can quite possibly uh, um, uh, wrap things up now. I let me just simply say. Um, Perhaps I can go um, back to my initial slide at the beginning just to remind you of um, where we're going to be um, next week. Um, so um, for those who joined late, um, uh, this is, I mentioned at the very beginning, um, and we, so here we have. Um, so today's session, such a useful session. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you, sir. Incredibly useful for someone who's just on the scene. Thinking, how do I get started? This was absolutely perfect. Um, so this was the kind of the, the intro, as it were. And we get progressively more complex as, it, as we go through. Next week, we've got a series of presentations that show how AI and um, uh, is being used not just in, in the architectural design, but also in fashion design and car design in the world of art and so on, which I think are gonna be really super interesting just to give you a range. And of course, as architects, we can start dabbling, shall we say, in those territories, whether we know what we're doing or not, we can start dabbling just as we've seen um, Barbara, uh, who's a fashion designer, working on architecture. Um, uh, I, uh, secondly, um, the um, uh, art and design, uh, sorry, then after that we have controlling AI, uh, which is gonna have partly look X, but partly also uh, Carlos Bannon, how do you use control net to control things? Um, and uh, then um, advanced AI uh, following that, which is gonna be like 3D modeling and so on. And we're gonna finish up with a, a panel discussion, bringing in all the kind of key players, certainly in terms of architectural uh, practices and things like Patrick Schumacher and so on, talking about how uh, AI leads to forms of creativity, which I think is going to be uh, an amazing thing. We had a panel before, but things happen very quickly in AI. And, and what we were talking about six months ago um, doesn't necessarily um, uh, hold true anymore. Let me just simply say that um, uh, if you want to uh, follow all this, um, uh, on the, the uh, we put all our Instagram addresses. This is mine um, on here. This is Joshua's um, uh, uh, Instagram address, um, and this is Sarah's uh, Instagram address down here. Of course, also Digital Futures is promoting these things. But on Instagram as well, you can find a number of um, other sites which are promoting this design mid journey and so on and so on and so on. There's a lot out there. Um, so. Um, I hope that everyone has found this useful. Um, it's meant to be useful. I hope that we're democratizing education and sharing these views all over the world, especially for those from less privileged communities. That's the intention here. Um, I'd like to finish off by thanking in particular Joshua and Sarah, incredible contributions, a, a few glitches in the technical side, but never mind, didn't matter. We got the message across and they were, Super useful, super useful, very, very didactic um, uh, um, uh, 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 presentations. Um, I, I expected that from you, Joshua, because you're such a rock star. Sarah, you have got to become a professor. This was absolutely fabulous. You are, you are so good at explaining things. And finally, I want to kind of thank the Digital Futures team. There's, I mean, I, I will probably, if I mention everyone, I will probably leave out a name somewhere, but th this is a team effort. This is genuinely a team effort. There is a lot that goes behind the scenes. Um, I always refer to the iceberg, what you see is 10%, but actually we are planning these things months in advance. There's a whole team that are working selflessly, putting together things, composing the posters, composing, setting up the web links, and God knows what else. And that is such a, a generous act, an act of, of sharing your passion. But maybe I could just mention just a few who've been, who've been part of this. I mean, of course, Angelica and Sarah and, and Giovanna has been part of the, our think tank, as it were, but we've had uh, Michael Just in, in Berlin, who's been incredibly helping also, not just this session, but also the sessions on Sunday. We have Bavlin, who's been filling in everywhere, all over the place. We, we've got uh, Gustavo and, and our whole team out there. So it is it is wonderful to see how the, our passion, our, our collective passion for architecture is, is, is making available all this really important information. 
and for free. I mean, the other thing I would say about this is that you know the lineup we've got coming up in the next few weeks, there are only certain few people around the world, including Joshua and Sarah, who can talk with some authority about these things. And you need to have a global platform in order to get these ideas across. So what we want to give you in the next few weeks is further information that really are going to allow you to pursue this and follow this, because for sure, this is going to be a game changer in design culture as a whole, and you either get with it and find out what's going on, or you might potentially get left behind. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you, Sarah. Fabulous presentation. These are going to be uploaded onto our YouTube channel for everyone for free. And it's wonderful for you to feel your, thank you for your generosity in, in, uh, in sharing these thoughts today. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you so thank much. you. Thank you. It was great. Thank you.